tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. Need a crime scene cleanup? How about a crime scene cleanup in a hoarder's house? Well, free market problems get free market solutions. It only makes sense I ended up with Caesar. I guess you could call me the President and Caesar the VP. But those are pretty prestigious titles considering the nature of our business. We're no executives. We aren't too proud to get our hands dirty either. I was strictly crime scene cleanup before Caesar and I joined forces. With violent deaths at a relative low, my job was easier than ever. Seldom were the days picking brains out of stucco ceilings, bleaching bloody grout, and peeling human skin off the undersides of subway trains. Natural deaths were common enough, but dragging Grandma's deathbed to the dump was hardly a day's work. Caesar was a sanitation technician, though he'd also answer to garbage man, shit shoveler, and, of course, hey Chico, you can't dump that here. Stuffing dirty old clothes into a contractor bag while I sponged biohazardous who knew what from the floor of some geriatric death fest, we mused at how often we ran into each other. Why not combine forces? We were like two peas in a pod, after all. But since the peas were a little too cute of a name, we decided to call ourselves the buzzards. Dead bodies, toxic waste, or just your old couch. If you need it gone, Caesar and I will swarm in and make it happen. The buzzards take on all carrion. No job too big or too small. Well, in hindsight, maybe I shouldn't have said no job too big. Not that I don't appreciate our special little spot in the police chief's Rolodex, but those scumbags have to be belly laughing back at the precinct. Sure, we are the men for the job, but they sent us into hell. And they sure as hell know it. Some hoarders keep dozens of cats. Some hoarders keep decades of newspapers. Some hoarders keep spackle buckets of their own bodily waste. Helen Waltman. She kept everything. It was an old cape house on the outskirts of Orange Oaks, spaced out from the neighbors, like the houses themselves knew to stay away from this one. The smell hit us at a hundred yards with the windows closed, a vile kind of rot fused with a repellent tang of death. The place was standing there like a filthy white tombstone wound with crime scene tape. No actual crime, per se, had been committed, but there had been a death. The back door had been inaccessible for years, it turned out. Once the horde became so prolific that it collapsed over the front door, there simply was no way out for an old lady. Helen Waltman had entombed herself. I backed the dump truck as close to the house as I could. We got out and suited up, trying to hold our breath until we got the masks on. If I had known it was going to be this bad, I'd have been fully geared up before we reached the county line. Standing on the front stoop, I could hear the living biomass beyond the door. Caesar and I stopped and looked at each other. It was clear we were in for a tough one. There's a stinker in there, bro, Caesar said. I nodded. When a guy like me was this near to tossing his cookies, it certainly was a ripe petunia. You hear that? Hear yeah, what? Caesar asked. Fucking cockroaches. There's always fucking cockroaches, bro. But he knew what I was getting at. There were different levels of bug problems. This one, you could diagnose before you opened the door. It was terminal. Caesar gave me a friendly shot in the arm. Bro, where I come from, the roaches got wings. Yeah, well, I'm from New Jersey. The door opened with an almost pressurized release of stench. On instinct, we stood aside as if to let it dissipate. A useless gesture. I looked at him and he looked at me, silently daring each other to go in first. You going first, bro? Of course I was. I always went first. I guess it's on account of me being the president and all. I readjusted my breather and peeked inside. It looked like the entrance to a cave. Two shovels left on the floor... Presumably the ones the cops used to dig out Helen Waltman. 
I stepped over the threshold, turning sideways to skirt the stacks of composting garbage. Past the sphincter of an entranceway, I spotted a chain hanging from the ceiling and pulled it. A yellowed old light illuminated the horde. Roaches cascaded down the walls, disappearing into the mountains of filth. At my feet lay what remained of the woman. The lucky cops, rookies no doubt, had been kind enough to remove the body, but the silhouette of melted flesh stained the floorboards like a grisly chalk line. I'm no forensics expert, but it's pretty clear she'd been there for quite a while before the cops showed up. It's also clear she was lacking in the friends and family department. I looked around. Household artifacts pocked with mold, strung with clotheslines wall to wall, hung with black and nameless dross. Shadows swaying with the loosely hanging light bulb, crawling with bugs, composting in its own heat. I've said this before, and maybe I've meant it every time, but I've never before said it so sincerely. This is the worst one I've ever seen. Caesar was turning in circles, overwhelming himself before the work even got underway. How does this even happen, bro? You'd think the bitch changed her ways at some point, wouldn't you? I shook my head. People don't change. You spend your life trying to fight who you are, but... In the end... Yeah, I guess no one knows better than you, he said. He's right. Clean up enough pointless suicides and you start wondering what took them so long. No one jumps off a building the first time it crosses their mind. No one swallows a bottle of barbiturates in the CVS drive thru No one pulls a ten-pound trigger on a whim. Most people are designed to preserve their lives at all costs. Others seem programmed to self-destruct. It's only a matter of how long they can fight it off. Eighteen years? Twenty-five years? Sixty-five years in the case of Helen. If I had to guess, I said to Caesar, I'd say Helen Waltman was fucked up from day one. Fair enough, bro. And I guess we're fucked up now, too. Fucked indeed. There were several roaches already crawling on my legs. You'd think by my line of work that roaches don't bother me, but they still give me the creeps. They're not the same as bugs to me. Bugs are alive. Cockroaches are undead. I stomped one foot, then the other, a strategy that only works in the less insistent buggers. The hangers-on are the hungry ones. Those I name. Bob, Dave, Charles, Ted. I named them each as I brushed them away. Clearly a neuroses, but we've all got our coping mechanisms, don't we? I've been asked a thousand times, how do you do it, Steve? All the filth, all the death, the roaches, the big ones. The ones that sprint up your arms and legs and just stop when they find a good place to stare at you. They sit there, watching. Nothing but their antennae moving. Just waiting. Never turning back around. Every move they make is conspiratorial. Up to your eyes to drink from your tear ducts. Or into your ear canals to cling to your eardrum and nibble the precious wax. I've seen videos of doctors excavating these creatures from the heads of their hosts. Peace by malefic peace. Like a crude abortion. So, how do I immerse myself in them without losing my mind? I don't freak out. I don't try squashing each and every one. I name them... I treat them with uncommon respect and expect the same in return. <sighs> You're out of your mind, Caesar said. How many bags you bring? Not enough, bro. Maybe fifteen dozen? Well, let's go get them. We turned to head back out. On the way to the door, my eye caught the corner of a picture frame on the wall, mostly obscured by garbage. A picture frame... The idea of Helen hanging a picture in there was so utterly weird. I just had to see what it was. I lifted the picture out of the mess and took it outside with me. In the daylight, I saw it wasn't a picture at all, but a framed newspaper article. It was almost impossible to read through the stained and mold-riddled glass, but I made out this much. House fire in Orange Oaks claims two. 
Underneath was a faded picture of a burned-out house surrounded by fire trucks. The smaller print was illegible, but the headline gave me the gist of it. What do you got there? Caesar asked. Picture frame. It was hanging on the wall. I was curious to see what Mrs. Waltman considered a decoration. Caesar chuckled. <laughs> and what is it? I showed Caesar the framed article. He squinted to make out the moldering print. Damn, bro. Who saves articles like this? I shrugged. I've seen people save newspaper clippings, but... You know, they're usually for happy occasions. Fuck yeah, man. You know who saves shit like this? Serial killers. Huh. <laughs> Anything hell in here was a serial killer? Maybe an arsonist, bro. She probably burned the house down. He handed the frame back to me. Maybe you're right. Pretty creepy. This bitch is burning us too, Caesar said, yanking a box of contractor bags out of the back of the truck. A few dozen 60-gallon bags later and we'd barely made a dent. Old Helen had been quite the collector. Once you dug out the organic rod, everything from old banana peels to decomposing newspapers, you'd start to notice patterns here and there. A box of china dolls and stuffed animals. A set of Christmas ornaments in a labeled cardboard box. There's a kind of subtext to these things that makes me uneasy. Things she wasn't merely compelled not to throw away, but valued as part of something meaningful. In dealing with the dead, meaning was something best to set aside. I learned through the years to try and separate the destruction from the humanity beneath it. Anything that threatens that separation is a threat to my existential comfort. It's best to compartmentalize whenever possible. I've cleaned up a graveyard's worth of remains over my career. Scenes of cataclysmic violence to quiet despair. The bad ones were gross enough to be... Well, gross. But there were others. Too dark to write off like a horror flick or the cover of a Thangoria magazine. The quiet ones. Some had been moldering so long they barely even stank anymore. Just the sour reek of old marrow and the rotten remnants of some failed ecosystem crawling up the walls like the ruins of a fallen civilization. They may not be the most repugnant cases, but they're undoubtedly the saddest. Not only did these people die alone, they rotted unnoticed. They'd been forgotten long before they left. You can't get more alone than that. Sometime around when normal people are taking their lunch break, I came across another framed newspaper article. After naming and politely wiping away the roaches, I read the headline. Waltman's service to be held this Wednesday. Underneath, the same picture of the fire scene. I consider just tossing it into the garbage and forgetting about it, but my compartmentalization system was faltering. Besides, I was kind of curious. I took the picture frame out into the daylight and squinted to make out what I could of the article. Survived by their daughter Helen, seven, who... Vista's home for orphans. Services for Mary and Theodore Waltman. Wednesday, April 7th, at Woods Memorial. Well, that explains the first article, I thought. Her parents had died in that fire. That's why it had been so significant to her, being seven at the time. Pretty well disqualified her from being an arsonist. I tossed the frame aside to the back of the truck and turned back to the house. Something occurred to me. Would all of this have happened if none of that had happened? I'd had Helen pegged as doomed from day one. Most of these people, I thought, were doomed to make a mess of themselves. Maybe that was just my compartmentalization speaking. I found Caesar in what was intended as the dining room, certainly the most bioactive room in the house. He was balancing a shovel full of fly-swarmed filth on its way into a drum. Off the side dangled a matted and slimy cat's tail. I expected we'd come across plenty of these. We got cats, Caesar said. So, this lady, I began. Her parents died in that fire when she was seven. She ended up in an orphanage. What? You find more articles? Yeah. 
Caesar tipped the shovel, dumping the moldering cat corpse into the drum liner. A swarm of enervated flies abandoned ship. Bitch, you could have done it, he says. At seven? Who the hell knows, bro? Why are you even telling me? Um, well, I guess I figured you ought to know. Maybe I owe it to Helen, since you've already besmirched her memory and everything. I besmirched her memory? He gestured obviously around the room. Bro, I don't even know what besmirched means, but I'm pretty sure she did this shit to herself. Fair enough. Just thought I'd tell you the latest developments. I've always liked a good mystery. Caesar dug in with the shovel and immediately scooped up another cat. Half of another, anyway. It came out bisected at the midsection, leaking entrails and putrefaction. This cat's besmirched, bro. I chuckled. Yeah, I guess it is. Seven dozen bags in and I'd broken through to deeper layers of rot. I encountered some cats of my own, not one among the living, partly eaten some. The slimed and disjointed limbs coming loose with the slightest tug. I seized one by the tail but the skin slid degloved from the bone. The roaches had nested deep in the mass and scrambled to find darker recesses as I uncovered them. Well, most of them did, anyway. The others I named and brushed back into the heap, some with the size of a dime. Others were the size of silver dollars. The big ones were the worst. They seemed to have evolved over their underlings, some awful sentience in their twitching antennae. Tom, Dan, Pete, Brian. Underneath, I found my first piece of furniture. An ottoman so bug-eaten and soaked with gore the original pattern of the fabric was indiscernible. A few bags later revealed the sofa, a dead cat burial ground. Cats stuffed between cushions, melted into the upholstery. Dozens of them, some reduced to bones and dry pelts, others in various states of decomposition. Finally, I found a wooden chest with a padlock on it. Curious thing, I couldn't help but wonder what, with the rest of the house the way it was, a hoarder of this magnitude would want to keep in a relatively safe place. I shouldn't have cared. Wouldn't have cared, but since I'd seen those framed news stories, I'd become more invested in this mystery than I should have been. I'd failed to follow my own professional advice. And now, I was asking myself the same question Caesar had. How does this even happen, bro? I aimed the blade of the shovel with a hasp at the body of the lock and brought it down. After three strikes, the hasp hung loose. I lifted out the lock and opened the lid. Inside the chest was an old photo album. I took it out and started flipping through the pages. Scenes of a happy family. I recognized a house as the same one pictured in the newspaper clippings. Photos of Helen as a little girl. Her parents, Mary and Theodore. Her father pushing her on a swing set helping her mother prepare food in the kitchen. Polaroid photos with the dates jotted down at the bottom. Somewhere in the middle of the album, the picture stopped abruptly. The last date was March 1952. A photo of Helen. Her lips pursed over the seven candles of her birthday cake. The pages after that were all empty. I closed the photo album and just stood there for a minute. Normally, I'd just throw it in the bag with the rest of the garbage, but I just couldn't do it. I set the album back in the chest and closed the lid. From the other room, I heard Caesar cursing. This crazy-ass bitch, bro! How does this even happen? By mid-afternoon, it was clear this was going to be a three-day job. Well over a hundred sixty-gallon bags of garbage were piled into the dump truck, and it was going to take multiple loads before the demolition team even got near this place. I was still chipping away at the living room, and Caesar in the dining room. Having made a notable dent in the mess, the roaches seemed to be losing confidence. Still, there was a long way to go. Fuck! I heard from the dining room, a little sharper than Caesar's typical refrain. You all right in there? Tell me you didn't get caught. No, bro. I just... A crash. Not the typical crash of garbage into a bin, but a louder one. A great shift of garbage like an unstable load in a truck. You all right in there, man? Fuck, bro! Another shift. Another crash. 
I dropped my shovel and started fighting my way over to the piles of garbage. Caesar! Hap, bro! I was nearly there when another crash sent Caesar flying backwards out into the hall. He landed with his back against a closet door, shattering slats of wood. What the hell happened, man? There was a look of horror on his face. He pointed into the dining room. A mass of black garbage emerged from the door. Not a collapsing pile like I expected, but a figure. An immense human figure. But not human at all. A creature. A mass of excrement loaded with decomposing cats, chicken bones, fast food wrappers. A golem of compacted shit. What the fuck? The golem advanced on him. I grabbed for his suit and yanked him out of the hall. We landed with our backs against a heap of trash, scrambled backwards to get over it. We're fucking out of here, bro! The golem roared, filling the room with hot decomposition. We made for the door, but my foot hit something slippery and went out from under me. Caesar and I collided and we went down hard. We scrambled to get up, but the golem bowled a huge arm through the trash pile, spraying garbage, roaches, and rotting organic matter everywhere. Something heavy hit Caesar and he fell back to his knees. Caesar! The golem was on approach. Arms outstretched, it was plowing through the heap, gathering the trash about it like a strengthening wave. Caesar, get up! Another roar and the two of us were bowled over by a wall of filth. I felt the pressure against my chest, felt my feet lifted from the floor. I twisted my face away, spit something foul out of my mouth. Caesar! I didn't see him. He was completely buried. Caesar! The golem was closing again. The trash heap shook with every step. I struggled to free my arms, managed to get one loose, started clawing away trash where I thought Caesar's head might be buried. It was difficult to breathe. The weight of the garbage was crushing. The golem roared again, a freshened wave of heat and stench. It swung an arm, eviscerating the heap of garbage and spilling me out onto the floor. I turned my head and saw Caesar lying prone. He wasn't moving. The golem stood over us. Down its legs of compressed shit runnel drips of the same and foul liquid. A stench that presided over the horde. It was standing in the stained silhouette where the cops had found Helen Waltman's body. I pushed away on my ass and elbows, a stabbing pain that spoke of a broken collarbone. Roaches crawled over my hands, but this was the least of my problems now. The golem roared. Liquid shit cascaded down its arms and legs. It reached down and grabbed Caesar, lifted him effortlessly into the air and flung him across the room. He hit the wall and rolled onto the dead cat couch, his head hanging at an odd angle. I fought to get to my feet, but a shooting pain in my leg sent me back to the floor. Oh, my knee. God damn it. I pushed away until my back was against a wall of garbage. The front door was blocked. The windows were blocked. The hallway was blocked. Caesar was unconscious, maybe even dead. And here I was with this monster, staring at me with its non-existent eyes, coming toward me with its arms extended, ready to... Helen! The golem slowed its approach. It stopped no more than six feet away. I couldn't believe it. Was this thing really Helen? I wasn't sure if the thought had really occurred to me, or I just named it on a whim the same way I did for the cockroaches. Maybe on instinct I'd done both. I know what happened to you, Helen. I know about the fire, about your parents, it was a terrible thing. The golem didn't move, but there was no other way to read its expression. Talk. Just keep talking. You lost everything, Helen. When you were seven years old, you'd lost everything and you were afraid to lose anything ever again. So you kept everything. I understand, Helen. It wasn't your fault. The golem was still as a statue, 
shimmering with roaches as it stood listening. Could it really be listening? In the corner of my eye, I saw the overturned chest where I found the photo album. I had an idea. I saw your album, Helen. I didn't throw it away. It's still in the trunk. Do you want me to get it for you? It was the first time the golem moved since I started talking. It turned its head toward the trunk. Something in its body language told me yes. It was okay to go get the album. Painfully, I got to my feet. I limped to the chest and retrieved the album. When I turned back to the golem, to Helen, she had her hands extended. Hands of wet and clammy shit the size of hubcaps, wriggling turds for fingers. I opened the album and placed it in her hand so she could see it. I didn't see any eyes in the face, no features at all. Still, I got the idea she was indeed looking at it. Slowly I backed away. I understand you were afraid of losing things, Helen. But not everything is worth hanging on to. Your memories, the good ones, they're what's worth holding on to. A tense moment as the Helen monster raised her head from the album. Had I said the wrong thing? I knew hoarders could be violently protective of their stuff, were often unreasonable when confronted with their illness. Dealing with these people was far outside my scope of practice, I'm just a glorified garbage man. The last thing I'm certified to do is provide counseling to mentally ill monsters. But just as I was bracing myself for the inevitable attack, the Helen monster appeared to relax. Its non-existent eyes turned back to the photo album. It flipped through the pages, one after another, turning its head left and right to see every photo. And when it reached the last page, the one dated March 1952, I remembered. It stopped turning the pages and just stood there, looking down at it. Almost tenderly, it laid its giant slimy hand on the last page. That's what's important, Helen, I said. All the rest, all this garbage, it's time to let it go. I'm not trying to take away anything important, Helen. I'm just... I'm just trying to clean up the... It slammed the album shut and I braced myself again. There was no attack. Instead, it clutched the album to its chest. It hugged the book, squeezed it tightly against its gory and fecal body, squeezing and pushing until the album was buried in its chest. Until the entire album was inside its body, pushing and smearing over it until the cover was no longer visible. I didn't dare to move. Having subsumed the photo album, the monster turned its attention back to me. But something was different now. I didn't feel threatened. The golem seemed to be smaller now. Looking down, I saw the fetid brown liquid trailing faster down its legs. Faster still. The golem was melting. Liquefying. With an unthinkable stench, the legs puddled sewage onto the floor. Bits of garbage, bones, bottle caps, bent silverware, the carcasses of rotting mice. Moldering cat pelts sloughed off, slid to the floor, the turd fingers dropped from the hands, landed in swelling pools of diarrhea. Melted to the thighs, Helen's torso dropped flat on the floor. Became flatter still as the septic flash drained into the floorboards. The skull of some small animal... A plastic six-pack ring. An old Chinese takeout container. The liquid shit soaking like stain into the pine planks. Escaping through shakes and knot holes until the golem was no more than a black silhouette under a pile of half-digested detritus. The golem was gone. Helen was gone. She'd finally let it all go. For a minute or two, I didn't dare to move. Then, I heard a rustling across the room. Raw, 
What the fuck just happened? I ran to him, forgetting my leg was injured and tweaking it royally in the process. Caesar, you all right? I think so. My head freaking hurts. Where the hell are we? You don't remember? He was suddenly aware of the state of the couch he was lying on and got quickly to his feet. What the fuck, bro? This place is disgusting. Let's fucking get out of here. He wasn't getting any argument from me. You'd think, after a day like that, a couple of guys like me and Caesar would rethink our line of work. But, like I explained, people don't really change. At least most people don't. Maybe Helen Waltman changed in the end, but then again, after a little while to process this whole thing, I'm not sure any of it really happened. There was enough noxious gas in that house to kill someone, not to mention trigger a major hallucination. The way I see it, we were lucky to get out of there alive, shit golems or not. Caesar took one hell of a bump that day and still has no recollection of what happened. It probably happened when he fell backwards into the closet door. I thought about telling him what I saw, or what I think I saw anyway, but why bother? He already thinks I'm crazy for naming cockroaches. If I start telling him about shit golems, he'll probably have me institutionalized. At the risk of losing work with the police department, in any case, I declined to go back to the Waltman house. Whatever was going on in that place, it wasn't safe. I'm sure it took some palm greasing, but ultimately the house was bulldozed without a look from the environmental agencies and several million cockroaches were left without a home. I'm driving through a nearby neighborhood one day when the thought occurs to me. I wonder what's going on at the old Waltman house. I've got nothing important to do, so I hang a right on Old Creek Road and head out to Orange Oaks. It might only be my imagination, but when I pull up in front of the bare slab that used to be the Waltman's house, I can still smell a hint of that stench. Sitting there in my truck, the ephemeral memories wash through my mind like a weird dream. It seems impossible that any of it really happened. It seems impossible that such a horror as Helen Waltman's house could have been sitting there on that innocuous-looking concrete slab. I put it in park and walk across the lawn, watching my feet for wandering cockroaches on the way, finding none. I walk up onto the porch and onto the foundation, trying to picture where I initially spotted the stain left by Helen's remains. I walked over to the area, remembering how I saw the monster melt and soak into the floorboards. It's a flat foundation, no basement in this one. So you'd think, with a mess like that, there'd be at least some evidence of what happened only inches above. But there's nothing. Just like I thought. The whole thing was a crazy hallucination. Just as I'm turning to leave, though, something catches my eye. There's an old chest sitting in the lawn, just off the side of the slab. I remember it from the cleanup. It's the chest I found the photo album in. How'd that get left behind? <laughs> Who cares? I tell myself. But, as usual, my curiosity gets the better of me. Without a good reason for doing it, I walked over to the chest and flip open the lid. Inside, I see the photo album. How in the world? I pick up the album and flip through the pages. Those same happy scenes of Helen Waltman's childhood. Swinging with Dad. Cooking with Mom. Pictures of the old house before it burned down. And changed Helen's life forever. And on the last page, the one dated March 1952, a huge black handprint. On Gallows Hill that overlooked Witch's Valley, where the verdant whispering forests spawn the horizon, Delbert Denton lived alone in a very modest house in a cul-de-sac called Snake Den Road. Delbert was a bachelor, never married, and seldom, if ever, dated. No woman had ever visited his home with the exception of his mother. Professionally single and good at it, he came and went as he pleased, working from home, 
and answering to no one with the exception of his deleterious boss, who called once a day for a five to ten minute catch up. Delbert had only met the man once when he was hired on as a data entry specialist. He believed his boss to be inimical and guessed he had not managed to get the job through such an intimidating interview. However, he was wrong, being hired that day, and that was five years ago. Delbert had recently bought himself some new bedding with a comforter, which he was most proud of, and fresh new pillowcases. He spent more time in his bedroom than any other part of the house, since his workstation fit nicely against the far corner of the room. He preferred the lighting in this room above the others. He almost situated his workstation in the second bedroom, but being a smaller room, Delbert felt boxed in. His bed had been perfectly made, and he stood admiring how there was not a single crease to be found. He was so happy with himself, he took a picture of it and emailed it to his mother, who would be gushing over it, as she often would when Delbert did anything. To her, he was the perfect son. She used to really look forward to being a grandmother, but that was years ago. Delbert, being 40, might well be past the age when talking of having children. And when you've had no one to have children with, that might be a little late. As night approached, Delbert went through his nightly routine of taking a hot and steamy shower brushing his teeth, putting on his night clothes, and crawling into bed. It normally only took a few minutes for him to be completely comatose, but on this strange and impressionable night, something would change Delbert's routine abruptly. When he emerged from the bathroom, fresh and clean, he was fiercely startled by what he saw. There was a lump on his bed, the size of a human being, was under the covers, and a sheet in the comforter had been folded down at the foot of the bed. He knew for a fact that he did not leave the bed this way when he went for his shower. He had a picture to prove it. His ritualistic, peripatetic bedtime movement had been put off course by this lump right in the center of the bed. He rationalized it in his mind. Could it be a person? How else was this to be explained? Observing acutely, he didn't find this terrifying, merely unexplained. How could this lump have occurred? Delbert had no answer, but the big question was, what am I going to do about it? This was his most concerning thought. Undefinable as it was, he took a risk and approached the bed cautiously, not wanting to be scared out of his wits if this lump was a person. How could a person be in his house? He could not imagine something so extraordinary as a person crawling into his bed. Was it someone he knew? He very much doubted that, since no one visited. He could admit that he was not the best friend anyone could have. He was not very supportive and often found face-to-face communication awkward. He slowly pinched the sheet between his index finger and thumb and eased back the sheet. To his relief, there was no one under the sheets. Somehow, two pillows were laying lengthwise, and with the covers and the sheets being bunched up together, it gave the appearance of a body beneath the sheets. He was breathlessly relieved, not wanting to question how these pillows came to be arranged in such fashion. Delbert's sleep this night was infelicitous, with uncommon tossing and turning, and his mind reeling about those two pillows. It should have been the sleep of the year beneath his new bedding. Instead, he got very little sleep and worked himself up into worry. The next morning, he swore to himself that he would not let this unexplainable episode interfere with his day. He rose early, anxious to get his day started. He made the bed, creaseless again, and proceeded to the kitchen where he fried bacon and eggs with buttered toast. He knew he ate too much bacon, but the flavor hit his palate with absolute satisfaction, and beside the taste, he loved the smell. After a hearty breakfast, he decided to do some work. Though he was caught up with his target, he wanted to stay ahead with the data entries. 
This would give him more time away from the computer in the evenings, a time when he enjoyed a good nature walk along the trails south of his home. Walking into the bedroom, his breath was taken by a gasp. He heaved so hard at the sight that he thought he might be sick. The lump in the center of his bed had returned. His mind became resultant, seeing but not believing, like a dream sequence that was overloading his acute stress response. What is this? Delbert questioned. He moved slowly around the foot of the bed. The shape was exactly the same as before. He knew he found his pillows lying end to end on the first occasion, so this is what he should expect now. But what if it wasn't the pillows? No, of course it was the pillows. They were nowhere to be seen. This is preposterous, he thought. Inching closer to the bed, he gradually lifted the covers, as he'd done before, and there they were, just as he had predetermined. Two pillows. How was this happening? What was causing such an abhorrent occurrence? Removing the pillows from the bed completely, he stored them away at the top of his closet and tidied the bed again. Creaseless, smooth perfection. He convinced himself that he must remain austere, ascetical, and keep his wits about him. Now was not the time for a superstitious mumbo-jumbo. He was envisaging a calm, non-frightful day of data entry and would not allow himself to think about something as ridiculous as paranormal gibberish. His mother was the superstitious one, not him. This was no more than homunculi, not worth troubling oneself over. Dobbert sat at his desk and tapped away for the next three hours, never once looking over his shoulder at the bed. He induced himself into work mode, and he was accomplishing everything he had hoped. If he could finish this today, he could actually take the entire day off tomorrow. It would soon be finished and could guide his inertia into a sweet rest upon the bed. As soon as that thought crossed his mind, he stopped typing. His mind had readjusted focus. This was now a peremptory matter, and the desire to look over his shoulder was like an addiction needing to be fed. He cursed himself for being weak, but then justified the notion, only wanting to prove to himself that there were no pillows on the bed in the shape of a human body. As delicately as threading a needle, his head moved ever so gently to the right. Not truly understanding what taking a look would benefit, he did so regardless of how illogical the exercise was. When he had turned, his face drained of its color. It became a pallid shade of death, for what he saw could not be. The lump was in full view. It was again in the center of the bed, and in the shape of a human form. Delbert did not have to look to know what was underneath the covers. With a spasmodically incongruent outburst of unpredictable rage, brought on by the exaggerated complications of the cotton impressions, embedded in the fabric of abominable absurdity and with exceptional incoherent thought, Delbert grabbed a crutch that leaned against the wall from a broken ankle he had dealt with, in the previous year, and fiercely cudgeled the lump with mighty force in three good whacks. It did not move, nor did it fight back. The only thing he accomplished by the battering was to indent the shape so it no longer took on human form. Once he gathered himself and brought his demeanor under control, he ripped the covers off the bed to find two white pillows. He convinced himself that his outburst was adolescent, but he would no longer remain indolent. He stripped the entire bed of his new sheets, pillowcases, even the comforter. He bagged them in a giant black garbage bag and took them to the curb for trash collection, which coincidentally was scheduled for the same following morning. Afterward, all of the old bedding which he had retired was placed back in the bed and he ordered a pizza for dinner. He was more than determined to wind down, erase all neurenthesia from his mind, and although he wasn't much into sports, he was sure he could probably find a game of some sort to vegetate to. He did this for the remainder of the evening and into the night, 
And as morning came closer, Delbert saw that the time was 3 a.m. Disgusted with himself for gluing himself for so many hours to the TV, so many wasted hours, he realized that he was tired and it was time for bed. The game on TV had been interesting to watch, but he didn't know who'd won. He knew little about the rules of sports, and he assumed the highest score won. Before leaving his living room, he looked out the casement window, which adorned the front of the house, just to see if the black bags stuffed with his brand new bedding were still on the curb for pickup. He was relieved to see the bags still there, right where he had left them. He proceeded to the bedroom to find it as he had left it, his old bedding neatly covering the bed and no lumps to bother with. Delbert slept most peacefully, not waking once and dreaming very little, but of pleasant things. He believed that his worries with the bedding were over. He was awakened, unmolested, by the garbage truck making its rounds in his neighborhood, and that relaxed him even more. He glanced at the clock, and it was 8 a.m. That was the usual pickup time. Today was Saturday, no work to do unless he just wanted to get further ahead on the data entry. He wrestled with the notion of sleeping a couple more hours because he'd not slept that long, seeing as he went to bed late. He argued that he felt rested, and his taste buds could easily taste the bacon that he loved so much. The bacon lost, one out, and Delbert had made up his mind to get his day started. He fancied a walk, possibly, through the whispering forest. He loved that trail. It was seldom trekked by many at once, and that was the way he liked it. His isolation and avoidance of people were self-imposed. You could not say that he was a lonely man. One might suggest that he alone had extracted himself from the other people. His comfort level would instantly drop around strangers, although people that he knew, a couple of friends and his mother, he could cope with without the discomfort of feeling out of place. He was so thankful that the lump in the bed nightmare was over. He already had to force himself outdoors, and did so once in a while as a reward of sorts for a good day's work. He certainly wasn't going to stand by while some mysterious happenings caused him to flee the sanctuary of his own safe haven. No way, no how. As he thought these sorts of thoughts, he detected a peculiarity. He did not move. He became acutely despondent, imperceptibly motionless. He surmised with great confidence that his head was lying on the pillowcase of the new bedding, which he had stripped off his bed the night before, placed in black bags, and carted off to the curb for the garbage collection. He reinforced the previous night's sequence in his mind, not moving a muscle. He was sure of it once he played it all back. He remembered distinctly removing both pillowcases. Delbert had a strong, metered internal resistance to believe that his head was caressed against the very cotton fabric that he had gathered up and disposed of. What sort of witchery was this? Was this some phantasmagorical, otherworldly event? This evocative scare was a torment to his mind. No need to become fanatically unhinged had to be a logical, conclusive explanation as to how this pillowcase had found its way back to his bed. He remained obstinate that it was possibly due to being tired. Yes, that was it. He was so tired and disheveled after the game, he had missed the pillowcase. He reasoned more in doing so, thinking it was the former casing, simply made the mistake of covering the pillow with a new one, thinking all along it had been placed in the black bags and dragged to the curb. This was all becoming too lugubrious for him to rationalize. All of this probing of his mind concerning the events of the night was tiring, and he suddenly found that his rest, which he had gladly accepted, was now a dark, infelicitous cocoon, absorbing the bravery that he was dependent upon. The radical contusion of the truth that was something... Uh, anomalous and causing him antidromic distress. He shuddered at the thought, but now he was consciously aware that something was leaning against his back. It was heavy, soft, and warm. He could feel this thing down the length of his body. 
It was at this moment that he realized the sheets, the covers, and the comforter were not his old ones, which he had returned to the bed last night, but rather he was sleeping on the new bedding which he had tossed out. Ghosts, hauntings, paranormal activity. That has to be it, Delbert concluded. The bedding is possessed, inhabited, phantom energized. Delbert began the hard struggle with much effort to slide out of the bed. He dared not reach over to touch what he assumed was resting beside him. He resisted the temptation to take a glimpse of whatever had crawled into his bed while he slept. Ever so gently, he removed himself from the bed. Once his feet touched the floor, he shuffled over near his desk, where the crutch from his ankle break last year rested. Taking the crutch in his hands, he turned to face the bed. No, it can't be. His reserved, taciturn disposition was falling apart by the moment for there was no lump in the bed. The bedding was his old ones. There were no new pillowcases, sheets, or comforter. He shouted, Stop playing games with me! Show yourself! He became irresolute, as if his feet were hardened in heavy concrete. He received no reply, not a single hint that anything out of the normal was occurring. I'm the captain of my own soul. Leave me alone. His voice cracked in tearful oppression. He reasoned, waist deep in paronyms, paranoia, paranormal, without absolution. Every conclusion he rendered announced itself embarrassingly, and he felt used, slighted, and mistreated by an entity he could not identify or communicate with. Frustrated in this psychologically ripe fracas, which for the moment seemed one-sided for was the only one without emotional control in the room. He managed to lift his feet of lead. Putting one foot in front of the other, he made his way to the door. I'm losing my mind. That's all there is to it. I've gone mad. He opened the bedroom door and looked back to the bed. There it lay, hidden beneath his new bedding. The lump, bold enough to appear, but never to reveal. This made Delbert even more angry. He marched to the one-car garage that stored a can of gasoline for his push mower. Took the can to the backyard along with a box of matches. Determined to rid his home of this malevolent, bedeviling entity, he returned inside the house to his bedroom where the lump had not moved. It was wringing wet with sweat from the exertion, and his heart raced madly. This is so extraneous, but it must be done. He convinced himself. Yanking the covers from the lump only revealed what he already assumed he'd find. Two pillows, end to end. He struggled with the bulk of the load, but succeeded in getting everything, including the pillows, to the backyard. Away from the house, he laid it all out and doused it heavily with gasoline. Delbert made sure it was soaked. He lit the match and tossed it onto the petroleum-drenched cotton. The saturated material exploded in a ball of fire and very little smoke. The heat drove Delbert back toward his house. There, gotcha, he shouted into the red-hot blaze. Unexpectedly, a gust of southern wind, almost as heated as the inferno before him, blew in and across his lawn, lifting the flaming comforter off the ground, carrying it over Delbert's head, onto the roof of his house. The shingles immediately caught fire. Now Delbert had a house fire to fight. He ran for the water hose, which thankfully was close by, and twisted the handle wide open. He spread the roof for all about 20 minutes until the fire department arrived. A neighbor who had first spotted the fire in Delbert's backyard had immediately called the fire department even before his roof became an incendiary device. It took the fire team 30 minutes to get control of the blaze and extinguish the fire. Delbert's house was badly destroyed. The kitchen, living room, and guest bedroom were a total waste. His bathroom survived except for the smoke damage, but his bedroom, where his office was, was hardly touched even by ash. It was intact. Devastated and defeated, he called his mother and explained that he had accidentally burned down his house. Although she was elderly, she still drove a car and came to him right away. 
He packed what he could of the most important things to do with work and clothes and went to stay at his mother's house while he sorted everything out with the insurance company. He'd really made a mess of things and only wanted to take a shower and crawl into bed. After his shower, he had some watermelon with his mother, and he explained he would deal with everything the next day, that he just needed to get some rest. She told him she understood and wished him a good night's sleep. His bedroom at his mother's house was upstairs. It was the one he grew up in before going out on his own, so it felt a bit nostalgic, considering everything, to be back living with his mom. He hoped it wouldn't be long before he could get things sorted. He was thankful that he had rid himself of that tormenting bedding. He reached the top of the stairs and was walking toward the bedroom when his mother called his name. Delbert, honey, I wanted to tell you that you'll be sleeping on fresh linen tonight. I just bought a new comforter and bedding for your room. What a coincidence that the day I put it on the bed, you needed your old room back. Delbert stiffened. Should he keep walking toward the bedroom? Or should he return downstairs? Though he had just showered earlier, he was pouring sweat, as if someone had turned up the heat. He struggled to keep walking, practically dragging his feet in the shuffled motion, and he faced the closed door. Delbert turned the doorknob slowly and pushed the door open to find a lump in the middle of the bed in the shape of a human body, wrapped in the exact bedding he just burnt down his house with. Pete West, a man in his fifties, hair graying, zero pep in his step, a look of sorrow in his face, pushed a shopping cart in front of him, slow and steady, down the canned vegetable aisle. The search he was on this mid-afternoon was for just a few things, as today wasn't a normal shopping day. So, as he puttered along down the aisles, his mind was able to drift off to other times, when things used to be different, and how things could have been. Normally, Peter would be happy as he walked around the store, smiling and greeting those he came in contact with. Most of the town people knew him and enjoyed seeing the bright and cheerful joy. Today, however... Today everyone knew. Today, unfortunately, was the tenth anniversary of his wife's death. Not a day to celebrate, but a day to mourn, and the town mourned with him. Memories poured in, flooding his mind. He could remember where he was the day he got the call, when the phone had vibrated in his pants pocket. It couldn't have been a worse time to answer. Pete was with a client who had a tree growing through his home. They were standing in front of said tree, going over the homeowner's insurance. So, of course, the call went to voicemail. But the dreaded thing kept vibrating, first annoying him, but then becoming worrisome. So much so, he had to excuse himself to answer it. Officer Nelson Quick was in his 20s, but over the phone just now sounded matured well beyond his years. Peter. The man's voice was scratchy and dry like he had just finished crying. It's Nelson. Yes, Nelson. Why? Peter had started saying, but Nelson cut him off. Peter, you need to come down to the station right now, Nelson said. Nelson, I can't. It doesn't matter what you're doing. It's Emma. Come right now. Nelson seemed to be getting upset. Emma? What happened? I'm not saying over the phone. Just get down here now. Okay, Nelson, calm down. I'll be right over. I'm just down the street. So he excused himself from his client, telling him an important matter involving his wife had come up and he had to go. Without waiting for a response, he turned and ran to his car. He never looked back. Arriving at the station, seeing Nelson, and then being led to the morgue, these memories were all cloudy to him now. Like a nightmare, the brain buries far away into a deep, dark place inside the mind. He could barely remember identifying Emma. Her body was covered head to toe, and they had only pulled down the sheet far enough so he could just see her face. The rest of her was too mangled, they had told him. That much he remembered clearly. Though part of him wanted to see what his wife looked like under the sheet, 
He felt the urge to pull it, just to grab it and yank it down to see her crushed body, her limbs twisted and broken, but he hadn't done it. What would they have thought of him, and how could he live with those visions in his mind? So, with longing eyes, he only stared at her bloody face, her closed eyes and the way that beautiful long blonde hair had been all tangled and dirty. The pain from that day was here now, weakening his knees, urging him to fall as he fell into Nelson's arms that day. Everything had gone dark then. No sound had entered his ears, no light through his eyes, only the pain, like the pain he felt now. With a deep breath and great will, he forced the horrid images away. Blinking in the light of the store, images of canned vegetables filled his eyes. It was important to think of only what he needed for tonight and nothing else. The meal he was going to cook, now that he had thought about it, had been the first meal Emma had cooked for him so many years ago when they had first started dating. Funny how the mind works, isn't it? He thought, pulling down a can of corn from the shelf. It had been Jill, though, who had suggested he make his meal tonight. She thought it would be a nice way to remember his wife and celebrate the love and life she'd lived. It was important to keep in mind that the love she had once given still lived within him while he gave his own upon the world. Ah, Jill, he thought to himself. Jill was his first female encounter after Emma had passed away. She was tall, blonde hair, blue eyes, and a slim figure. A perfect fit for his lonely life. He wouldn't call her a first girlfriend or love, but a companion may fit better. Sure, she lived with him and was always there for him when he was feeling down. Always gave him a smile to brighten up his day. There were times of pleasure, times of laughter, and never a time when they'd been mad at each other. The perfect relationship but she had not been the only one. There was Jennifer, who had brown hair and brown eyes, slim figure also, but much larger up top than Jill. She'd been quiet so far, but she was new to the home, still learning the ropes. Eventually, she would start getting all the pleasantries the other ladies got. Peter still hadn't broken her in. He was still courting her in a way. It was important that she knew him well, and loved him the way he would do for her one day soon. And there was Jamie, who had come to him about a year before Jennifer. She was much shorter, only five feet three inches to be exact, but she was energetic, bright-eyed, and willing to please. There was no doubt she had been very special to him on those nights he was feeling rambunctious. At last, but not least, was Josie. She was more of a petite type with blonde hair and emerald green eyes, but very strong. The alpha female, Peter always felt she had the house in order and kept the other girls in line. Thinking about his girls improved his mood, and he whistled as he finished his shopping, hummed as he reached the checkout line, smiled ear to ear as he walked out of the store. His thoughts were with the girls, anticipating what the night would bring. Unfortunately, the thoughts distracted him from noticing the three men following close behind as he traveled back home. Peter lived in a rent-style home on just over an acre of land. After Emma's death, there was a short lawsuit which settled out of court, considering the truck company's driver had been intoxicated. The settlement was quite large, and Peter had been tempted to buy a larger, more luxurious home. But in the end, this was where his heart was. Emma would have wanted him to stay here. The house sat far off the street. His closest neighbor was a few hundred yards away. Alone and quiet was how he liked it. Just him and his girls in peace was what he craved every day. No kids screaming outside. No loud, busy streets with their honking cars. Just silence. Peter stepped through the doorway with his two bags of groceries. Jamie was sitting at the dining room table with a beautiful yellow spring dress draped on her body, her reading glasses lined on the tip of her nose and a magazine opened in front of her. This had once been Emma's favorite thing to do on a lazy Sunday. Josie was on the couch with the television on, wearing just a pair of shorts and a t-shirt, once Emma's favorite bum-around-the-house outfit. 
He could already see Josie was going to do just that, bum around the house for the rest of the day. But why not? It was Sunday, after all. Jill, I'm home, Peter said in a husky voice, not yelling, but loud enough for the house to hear. Peter went into the kitchen and placed the bags on the table. He embraced Jill, who had been standing by the stove, pan in hand. He wrapped his arms around her robed body, feeling underneath with his hands, realizing she was still naked, another trait of Emma's. She'd always loved walking around the house with only her robe on, nothing else. Taking it slow today, are we, Jill? Peter asked, growing excited as he cupped her breasts in his hands. Peter lifted her up and carried her down the hall to the bedroom, and then slammed the door closed behind him. The other girls smiled and stared. After some time had passed, Peter left the room, went back into the kitchen to get dinner ready. A joyful song whistled between his lips as he worked. Glancing back into the living room, he saw Jennifer sitting on the couch opposite of Josie. Strange, he didn't quite remember seeing her there earlier. He did, however, like the little plaid skirt and the white button-down shirt she was dressed in. This was one of Emma's playful outfits, something she wore when she wanted to get a little naughty in the bedroom. It was her go-to skirt, but the shirt never stayed on for long. With dinner simmering and wine poured, Peter went back into the room to get Jill. He stopped short at the door. She was dressed in a beautiful gown, one that had been Emma's so many years ago, one she had worn on special occasions, like weddings or baptisms. Jill? How? Peter stammered, trying to remember if he had gotten her dressed after their little love session. Things like this have been happening lately, incidents of lost time, minutes, hours, who knew how long sometimes. But the end result was the dolls doing something or being somewhere that he couldn't recall or even explain. Jill stared back at Peter, eyes wide with excitement, a beautiful smile across her face. She looked full of life. Jill, you never cease to amaze me. Peter took her hands and twirled around with her like a couple of dancers. We're all going to have a great time tonight. Peter danced Jill out into the kitchen, then sat her down at the table. You sit and rest while I... The sound of an approaching vehicle gave him pause. Who in the world could that be? He wondered, looking out the kitchen window at the blue sedan coming up the driveway. The evening sun was setting behind the trees in the distance. Peter hurried out the door and went outside to greet his visitors. Surely they had the wrong house, and he would just get them on their way. Three grinning men got out of the car. The driver was first to speak. Well, hello there, he said, walking toward Peter with his hand extended. Peter stayed on the porch. He felt uneasy, a sense that something was wrong. Hello, he responded, but didn't raise his hand. Are you guys lost? Are you Peter West? the driver asked. Depends who's asking, Peter said, getting defensive. Let's stop the games, West, the driver said. I know you are. And before Peter knew it, one of the passengers was right next to him with a gun drawn. Let's go inside. Back inside, Peter shifted his gaze nervously between his girls. Jamie was sitting upright, her glasses now placed on top of the magazine. Bright crystal blue eyes stared lifelessly at the four men. Jill stood in the kitchen staring at the three strangers who were looking around in wonder. Peter looked away from Jill to the couch where Jennifer was sitting, hands folded on her lap. Next to her, Josie was sitting with her legs curled up to her chest, her arms slightly wrapped around them. The smooth, angelic face that always smiled now looked dark, almost angry. J Josie? Peter stuttered nervously, fear raising in his heart. He almost forgot for a second that he wasn't alone. Well, holy shit. What in the world you got going on in here? The driver asked, waving his own gun around the living room. Playing house with your dolls or something? Peter didn't answer, just looked around nervously. These dolls or girls or whatever you wanted to call them. 
Sometimes when he was losing time, it almost seemed like they moved on their own. <laughs> Looks like we got a perverted freak here, fellas, one of the men said. Ain't that right, Nicky? He snorted a short laugh. <laughs> the driver, or Nicky, laughed along. <laughs> you can say that again, Dale. Peter's mind was spinning, his heart thudding with fear and excitement. One of the men was now standing by Jamie. He was pulling down the top of her dress, trying to sneak a peek at her breasts. She doesn't like that, Peter snapped. The man snatched his hand away and stepped back. The other men laughed while sweat beaded on his forehead. He wiped his shaking hand across it. Tommy, quit being such a pussy, Nicky said. Yeah, <laughs> stop being one and go grab one, Dale laughed. He walked over to Jill standing by the kitchen. Peter watched as he started to mess around with Jill's gown. First he unzipped it and it fell down around her feet. Then he removed the bra and started fondling her breasts. As he did this, he looked over to Peter, who was now getting angry. Stop that, Peter yelled. They actually feel pretty real, Dale said. Please, Peter pleaded as he watched a man lower his hand to Jill's panties. I I'm begging you to stop. Dale grinned at him and then slowly pulled the panties down, exposing her completely. He bent, looking down between her legs and then back at the others. Mm, looks real, too, he said. <laughs> he and Nicky started laughing. <laughs> Tommy only looked around nervously. Dale put his hand between the doll's legs, rubbing her with his fingers. <laughs> it kind of feels real, too, I guess. Stop it, Peter burst out. Whatever you're here for, just take it and leave us alone. Peter tried to move towards Dale, but Nicky had him by the arm. And where do you think you're going? Peter yanked his arm free, then turned and kneed Nicky between the legs. He then charged at Dale, who didn't seem to notice what was going on at first, but spun around at the last moment. Peter grabbed him by the shoulder with his left hand and cocked his right arm back. But Dale, completely calm, brought his gun up in a smooth swing, catching Peter across the left side of his face. Peter fell to the side, cracking his head against the dining room table. He crashed to the floor, unconscious. What the fuck, Dale? Tommy said. He raced over to Peter and knelt next to him. There was blood pouring from his forehead. It doesn't matter, Dale said. We're probably going to kill him anyway. He looked down at Peter's limp body. Is she dead? Shit, I don't know how to do this. Tommy looked afraid to touch him at first, but reluctantly placed a finger on Peter's wrist. I think so, man, he said, his voice breaking. Shit, I think we're fucked. He rubbed a hand repeatedly through his hair. Nicky moaned, getting to his feet. <sighs> Good for him. Bastard need my nuts. Y you didn't say we were killing anyone, Tommy snapped. Just shut up the two of you, Dale said. Let me think a second. He began pacing the floor in front of Jill. Two steps, turn, two steps, turn, like a caged animal. Uh, let's just get what we came for. Tommy, you come with me to help open the safe. Nicky, you clean up any evidence that we were here. And the body? Nicky asked. Leave it for now, Dale said, and left the room. Tommy trailed behind him like a lost puppy, glancing over his shoulder at Nicky before going out of sight. Nicky walked over to the couch. He saw Jennifer staring up at him, her bright, lifelike eyes gleaming hatefully at him. All Nicky could do was mush the doll's face aside, forcing it to fall off the couch. She bounced and landed on her side. Her skirt pulled up, exposing her ass. She had no underwear on. Nicky licked his lips in consideration, but the possibly dead man lay nearby. His forehead still poured blood, but Nicky wondered if it might not be as bad as it appeared. He gave him a firm kick to the side to check if he was faking, and just then he noticed a beautiful gold watch on the man's wrist. He squatted next to him and pulled it off. Inspecting it, he noticed the doll's ass again from the corner of his eye. Her most intimate of areas exposed. It does look real, doesn't it? <laughs> he said aloud. Nicky went to the doll and maneuvered it so it was on all fours. 
arms bent so to rest it on its elbows, legs bent and spread so that she was on her knees. Its hair hung down over its head. The skirt hiked up around its waist. Nikki fondled its curve, studying how real it was. It was soft and smooth. His mind was spinning now. If this was going to happen, it had to happen now. There was no waiting until later. But maybe there would be a later too, he thought, because this bitch was coming home with him. Nikki pushed a finger inside the doll, noting how dry it was. Well, damn, honey. No way I'm gonna be able to. Oh. Suddenly his head was yanked back by the hair. Oh, oh, what the? Nikki winced, reaching back for whoever was doing it. The pulling continued until the hair was practically being ripped from his scalp. When he finally opened his eyes looking through tears of pain, he couldn't believe what he saw standing in front of him. It just couldn't be real. <laughs> An insane little laugh escaped him. No! He was cut off by a silicone hand and arm entering his mouth and pushing down his throat. Nicky gasped as blood poured out of his mouth, his body convulsing. Nicky, what the hell you doing out there? A voice yelled from the other room. The arm slid free of Nicky's mouth, letting his body thump to the floor, still twitching, blood oozing from his mouth. Damn it, Nicky, I said to. Dell's voice stopped at the sight of Nicky on the floor, blood pooling around his head. What in the hell? Dell ran to Nicky's side, unsure what to make of it all. Only when he looked up did he see the naked doll sitting on the couch, the one he had taken the dress off of. But how did she get on the couch? Had Nikki put her there? And why the hell did she have Nikki's gun in her hand? And why was she pointing it at him? Before Dale could even consider it, the gun fired several times, each bullet entering his chest. Dale staggered, grunting after each shot. His eyes focused on the naked doll as he fell. His last breath released when his head crashed against the floor. Tommy ran into the room so fast he nearly slid across the floor. He gaped at the murderous scene. One doll stood, its arm dripping with blood. Another doll was on all fours, skirt down around its waist, its ass up in the air. A third doll sat on the couch, clutching a gun. And there was Nicky, blood pulling around his head, and Dell, his chest splashed in blood. Tommy's drill dropped from his hand and onto the floor, his eyes unbelieving of what they saw. They moved quickly around the room between the death and the dolls. The death, the dolls. There were three dolls in this room. Hadn't there been another? At the dining room table wearing the sundress, he tried peeking down her dress. Where was she now? She was gone. A few more steps into the room, he released the shaky breath and ran both his hands through his hair. The room eerily quiet. So quiet he could hear his own heartbeat speeding up. And then a hand reached over his shoulder and touched his chest. Fear like no other coursed its way through him. Urine ran down his legs and onto the blood-soaked floor. The hand massaged his chest mechanically. It was smooth but almost robotic, jerking down and up, side to side. Tommy closed his eyes and prayed this had all been just a dream, a dream that now had reached its peak of terror, and any second now he would wake up at home in his own bed. There was no luck in that prayer. God wasn't listening to thieves and murderers, not today. The sound of a drill made Tommy's eyes shoot open. He remembered that he had dropped it earlier, but who had it now? The answer came in a flash as he felt the tip of the drill bit touch the back of his head, and the agonizing pain when it passed through his skull and into his brain. But it didn't stop there. The drill bit was long, and it had some distance to go. All Tommy could do was twitch, his eyes crossing to watch the drill bit emerge from between them. A haunting moan bellowed out through the room as his body dropped to the floor. The drill left lodged in the back of his head.
911 dispatch. The operator answered. There was only static on the other end of the line. Hello? Anyone there? Are you hurt? Still more static, but then a sliding noise. Hello? Can you talk? More sliding in response, but then something chilling came through the line. A moan so ghostly, so sad. So loud the operator had to pull the headphones off. The first officer arrived at the house shortly. He knew Peter West very well. He hurried out of the car, noticing the door was left wide open. It may be a small town, but the people who lived here didn't usually leave their front doors open. Peter, he called out. Nothing but spine chilling silence. Inside, the house was dark, too dark to want to enter. The sound of another patrol car on the gravel driveway made him jump. Turning, he watched the car, but from inside the house came a sad moan, freezing the officer where he stood. What's up, Nelson? The other officer said, exiting his vehicle, but Nelson only swallowed hard. The other officer, noticing Nelson's widened face, asked again. Nelson? Nelson only turned to look at the house, his hand resting on his revolver. Nelson, what's going on? Shh. Nelson waved at him to keep it down. The two officers stood listening, but they heard nothing. The second officer moved to go inside, but Nelson grabbed his arm. Wait, Jimmy. Maybe we should get some more backup. There was fear written all over his face. And then another moan came from the house, louder this time, almost like it was calling to them, getting impatient. Concerned that there was someone hurt inside, Jimmy ignored Nelson and went for the door. Nelson tried to grab his arm again, but missed. Reluctantly, he went in after him. Inside the home, the two officers had the shock of their lives. Jesus. On the couch sat, from left to right, one doll wearing a sundress, blood splattered all over her face. Another doll, dressed in shorts and a t-shirt, blood covering most of her left arm. The next doll was naked, a gun clutched in her hand. The last doll wore a white blood-stained shirt and a plaid miniskirt. Across them lay Peter West, eyes closed, dry blood caked on his forehead. At their feet lay the bodies, one drool in blood, another with bullet wounds to the chest, and a third with a cordless drill stuck in the back of his head. What the hell happened here? Jimmy asked, afraid to move any further into the house. Peter? Peter moaned, struggling to open his eyes. Suddenly, the dolls all turned their heads to look down at him. <gasps> Jesus! At this, the officers froze. Nelson? I don't see anything, do you? Jimmy said nervously, unable to take his eyes off the dolls. Jimmy, I wasn't even here. Nelson turned and ran for the door. Jimmy followed seconds later. No one ever heard about what happened at the West home that day. Nelson and Jimmy stayed silent, and Peter didn't even have a clue. The only question he had was who had dug up his backyard and decided to plant a vegetable garden. The dolls know, of course. They still move from time to time, taking care of things when they need to be taken care of. Peter has a sense of it happening, but he tries not to pay too much attention. Some things in life, it's just easier to get past them. It's just easier to tell yourself I'm just losing time. The world is full of monsters with friendly faces. Heather Brewer it's been almost 35 years since Danny's gruesome murder, and the killer has still not been caught. Some say that they never will be. Like many unexplained deaths in the area, 
Danny's untimely demise and that damp stretch of the forest will only be added to the ever-growing list of missing people who simply do not exist anymore, and how they all met their ends will never be solved. Some speculate that he had been murdered by a local known to hide out in the woods, a feral homeless man called Buck. He was someone who liked to build dugouts in the dirt and pretend that they were his fallout bunkers. But most believe that something else took Danny's life, something that was not entirely human. And, more than anything, they all believe that the evil that did kill Danny can never be stopped. Danny died in 1991. He was seven years old. He had just moved to Dartmoor with his family. His father, Malcolm Vine, was a famous painter and had decided to scoop their family up from the dreary streets of Guildford in Hampshire and move them somewhere with more scenic vistas. That was how Malcolm described it to his family. Somewhere with brooding, rolling moors and deep valleys full of pine trees. Not somewhere with discarded beer cans clanging down desolate gray streets. Not somewhere with faded terrace houses and rusting warehouses. He wanted somewhere that was downright beautiful to wake up to. Danny's mother was a landscape designer. Her name was Debbie. She had built up a small company from nothing, and some of her best clients were famous actors, musicians, and even politicians. So, when Malcolm burst into their shabby townhouse one day and told her she was moving to somewhere with actual foliage, she was ecstatic. They were almost fifty and had decided it was time to wind down a little and start to enjoy the life they had built for themselves. It wasn't long until they found the perfect house for their family. It was a neat little cottage, wedged in between the terrace houses of Morton Hampstead in Dartmoor. Its white masonry walls were all slanted, having been built on a hill sometime two centuries ago. The thatched roof had a distinct bowing in the middle of it, but it had character. That was what Debbie had said when they viewed it. Four cute little bay windows and a heavy Victorian front door completed the front of the house. The door even had an elegant brass knocker for a doorbell. Everything they had wanted for their next chapter was the quiet countryside life with their two children, Daniel and Robert, Danny and Bobby. When the sale was agreed upon, they moved to their new life in July of 1991 around the time that Jeffrey Dahmer was arrested after the remains of eleven men and boys were found in his Milwaukee, Wisconsin apartment. They settled in quickly, and the local community soon recognized and loved the four of them. Malcolm Vine had a few fans down there anyway, and they were not too shy to ask for a personalized painting from him, for which he gladly obliged. It was no bother for him. He could easily finish a painting a day with his unique work ethic and talent. Debbie didn't take long to participate in local gardening projects, and even helped design the Market Town Center's flowering arrangement. Danny and Bobby joined Morton Hampstead Primary School in September. Danny started in year two, and Bobby started in year five. They both made friends easily. Danny had a curious innocence about him, and he was interested in almost everything. Even though he was only seven years old, he was incredibly perspicacious and would talk a great deal with his parents about nature and animals. Danny was like his mother, unusual yet strangely charming in many ways. Bobby was a little older and was more like his father. He was active and athletic always looking for a reason to compete with something. Yet, he was also very creative, and would often write short stories purely to entertain himself on those hushed, rainy Sundays at the house. Life was good for all of them, but it did not last. In 
It was a brisk autumn day when the family went for a walk with their new dog. Mid-October. They had driven to Fernworthy Forest and Reservoir to let Rufus, the dog, stretch his legs with his new family. It was only ten miles away from their home. The forest was a long and dark stretch of coniferous trees that straddled the manufactured reservoir, and eventually the wide-open, damp uplands of the moors. They'd pulled up near the boathouse on the reservoir at about ten. They all got out, and Rufus scampered around their feet, as excited dogs liked to do, while they all sorted themselves out. They put on their padded coats and Bobby helped Danny zip up his puffer jacket, smirking and play-fighting with him. Then they started walking south, towards the deep valley. Rufus ran off ahead, wagging his furry brown and tan tail back and forth behind him. Rufus was a mongrel breed, a cross between a sheepdog, border collie, whippet, and a Labrador. As such... He acted like all four at once. He was a dog constantly thrilled by anything. They'd been walking about an hour when they came to the tallest part of the forest. The low, white light from the weakened sun filtered through the gnarled branches. Malcolm and Debbie chatted casually about how best to decorate the living room and what paint would look good over the fireplace. Bobby jogged around with Rufus and threw sticks for him to fetch. But Danny was nervous. He'd never liked forests. There was just something about them that made him feel exposed. He often read nature books and knew that predators used stealth and camouflage to attack their prey. What better camouflage than a forest? But that wasn't what bothered him about them. After all, there were no bears, wolves, or other carnivorous predators in England big enough to attack humans, so that wasn't what had upset him. Instead, there was just something unnerving about the presence of the forest that really bothered Danny. He didn't like how the trees seemed to stop swaying when they walked past. He particularly didn't like how he couldn't hear any other animals. Danny hung especially close to his mother, where even she acknowledged his anxiety. As she talked with his dad, she gently reached down and stroked the top of Danny's head. She tousled his light blonde hair as she chatted, and somehow he felt much better. She had that effect on him. As much as he loved his dad... He felt much safer with his mother. But as much as his mother's affection temporarily helped, he still felt strangely on edge. As far back as he could remember, he felt that there was something different within him. He could hear and feel things that no one else seemed to be able to. He felt those unexplainable presences all around him. He imagined that he had a strange and unexplainable connection to this unknown force that was seemingly hiding in every dark place. Danny just did not like the shroud of the forest. His young imagination ran away with him, and he thought that there was something else out there, a ghastly being made of moss and twigs, or some kind of swamp creature like the one he read in his comics, and if Danny did not stay vigilant, the thing from the trees would come and snatch him away, right from his mother's grasp. Fernworthy Forest was an ancient sprawl of trees, deep valleys, and trickling streams. All over the aged spruce and pine, and even the damp floor, was a lurid green moss. Danny thought that the forest looked like somewhere dinosaurs would be wandering around. As Malcolm and Debbie held hands and smiled softly at each other, Danny felt the anxiety rising in his stomach. Every time he looked up at the unending rows of trees, he'd imagined seeing that monster between the branches. 
something slinking from tree trunk to tree trunk. He'd had enough, and he wanted to go home. He tugged at his mother's coat, and she then leaned down to him. Hello, dear. She smiled at Danny with that unmistakable warmth only parents can give. Danny couldn't meet her gaze. Yes? She prodded gently. He was half embarrassed, half scared. He winced and looked at the floor. Oh dear, are you okay? She then asked as she knelt down to him. Malcolm came around and also leaned down to his son. What's wrong, kiddo? Malcolm asked Danny. Nothing, I... Danny began to say, but stopped, looking back up at the tree line of the ridge. Oh, he's just a little bit nervous. Debbie finished for him. Bobby had heard the conversation and stopped playing with Rufus to run up to his little brother. What's that? Danny's nervous? Bobby asked their mum. Only a little bit, she said. Why? Bobby asked while looking at Danny. He doesn't like the forest that much, Bobby. You know that. Their mum told him. Bobby then rolled his eyes and threw his stick away for Rufus to go and fetch. Don't worry, Danny. They're only trees. They can't move or anything. Bobby grinned, and Danny suddenly felt incredibly embarrassed at all the attention he was receiving. He huddled into the side of his mother's coat and rubbed his cold nose against her hip. I'm fine. I like trees, honestly, he said, trying to feign confidence. You want to go back? His dad asked. Nope, Danny said and tried to smile, more of an attempt to ward off the unwanted fuss he was receiving. Hey, I've got an idea. Bobby chirped. I'll carry Danny. That way he won't be nervous. That's a great idea, isn't it, Danny boy? Malcolm smiled. Danny nodded sheepishly and let go of his mother's hand. Bobby then gleefully ran over to Danny and turned his back on him. He held his hands down and back in preparation to catch Danny's legs. Jump on in three, two... Go! Bobby chirped. Danny did, and Bobby caught him. He then shuffled and hoisted Danny on fully. Bobby started marching up the gravel path, and the pair took off in front of their parents like a little rocket made of puffer jackets. Debbie chuckled as she watched them and went back to holding hands with Malcolm. Not too fast! Debbie called after them. Bobby was incredibly strong for his age. He steamed up the hill with Danny on his back like Danny was made of feathers. The blur of darkened trees bounced past Danny's vision as he swayed from side to side on Bobby's back. In an instant, Danny felt his fear melt away like it was butter on a hot pan. He then wondered why he was so nervous at all. It was ridiculous. There was nothing out there. Bobby was right. They were just trees. They couldn't move. Danny wanted to prove to Bobby that he was no longer scared to keep that feeling of confidence. I'll carry you now, Danny exclaimed. Huh? Bobby replied. I'll carry you now. Put me down and I'll show you. Bobby stood there with his hands on his hips, breathing heavily, ignoring the single bead of sweat rolling down his forehead. Bobby stopped walking, and Danny then slid off his back onto his own two feet. Bobby then turned around and saw that Danny had that mischievous grin again. That grin always meant that Danny wanted to compete with him. Bobby liked it whenever Danny was in these kinds of moods. He loved nothing more than play fighting and subtly proving himself against his younger brother. I bet you can't go as far as me, Bobby announced with a smirk. Bet I can, Danny replied. They took turns giving each other piggybacks up and down the path in front of their parents, 
and Bobby was surprised that Danny could match him in strength. He was rueful and impressed that he was still just as strong as himself, even though Danny was younger. After another hour of walking, the family came to a little piece of history right in the middle of the forest. In a small clearing between the trees stood 27 granite slabs, arranged into a perfect circle that looked in on one big boulder in the middle. On the middle boulder were archaic glyphs. Fernworthy Cairn Circle was a Bronze Age ritual circle where ancient shamans were said to come and sacrifice small animals back in the days when the forest was young. The vines didn't know that the whole of Dartmoor, although outwardly pleasant and striking with its beautiful landscapes, was steeped in a deep-rooted history of the macabre and black magic. Everything from witches to demonic entities was said to have originated from those moors. Having just moved to the area, they were unaware of the strange folk tales that lingered over Dartmoor like a perpetual fog, but they would all soon learn about them. The family stopped at the site and just looked at it. Malcolm was more intrigued than off-put by the stone circle. He didn't even know it was there. He didn't see any mention of any historical sites on the map before they had set off from the car. Rufus, the dog, however, lowered his head and cowered. His tail fell between his hind legs, and he began to whimper loudly. There was something about the circle that made him scared. Malcolm looked up to the sky. Without the shield of the trees, Malcolm couldn't help but notice just how low and gray it was. The clouds were dark and laden with foreboding. It looked like it would rain soon. We should probably head back now, Malcolm said to Debbie, looking across at her. Looks like rain is coming. I think so too. We've walked for two hours. That's enough to warrant a glass of wine, isn't it? Debbie replied with a wink. How about a whole bottle instead? Malcolm jibbed, wrapping one arm around her and pulling her tight. <laughs> and a nice big roast dinner and crap TV? Now you're speaking my language, Mr. Vine. Debbie blushed. Right. Bobby? Danny? Malcolm shouted playfully. We're off. Let's get out of here. However, while the couple had been chatting, they hadn't noticed that Danny had approached the stone circle. He had wandered up to the first stone alone. Rufus barked nervously at everyone as Danny crossed over the perimeter. But Danny didn't hear the dog. He was too enamored with the stones to pay attention to anything else. He walked past one of them and, almost as if he were in some trance reached out to brush his fingers lightly across the rough, abrasive ancient slab. His footsteps were slow and serene. When he reached the circle's center, he stood there and glanced up at the monolith. There he saw, carved into the middle stone, a spiral. It was a snake eating its tail. Danny stared at it, hypnotized, and the world fell silent around him. He didn't understand what the symbol meant, but was fascinated by it nonetheless. He felt as if he'd seen it somewhere before, but he could not say for certain. Danny! Bobby shouted from behind him, snapping him out of his lull. Come on, we're going home now! Okay... Danny replied absently, still not taking his gaze away from the stone carving. Danny, if you hurry, I'll get you a Coke, Malcolm called to him. Coming, Danny said, as he then turned away from the strange glyph and the brooding stone. He walked back out of the circle and back to his family. They all turned around and headed back down the gravel path. Standing in the knee-high grass from the tree line behind them, 
the dark, evil thing watched Danny leave. Its lips drew back hungrily at the promise of the feeding to come. The family headed back down the track that they'd all walked up an hour previous. The wind cut through the trees mercilessly all around them. The temperature had dropped, and everyone was getting tired. The enjoyment from the track had left them a while back. There was less talking now, and Malcolm sighed frequently. Rufus sauntered around in front of them, sniffing and urinating on various rocks. Danny was dragging his heels as he walked sullenly behind his mom and dad. They all wanted to get back to the car and back into the warmth as soon as possible. But not Bobby. Bobby was still full of energy. He danced around them and asked his mother an interminable stream of questions. She had lost the desire to reply with enthusiasm and instead resigned herself to grunting and shrugging her shoulders at her son's questions. Hey mom, how big is a blue whale? Bobby squawked. Oh, I don't know, dear, uh, ten meters? Debbie mumbled as a reply. Not feeling satisfied with the responses, he then turned his attention to Danny and challenged him to a game of hide and seek. His parents had continued walking down the path ahead of the pair of them. Danny, hide and go seek? He said. What? Danny replied absently. We haven't played it in ages. You hide first and we'll see who can find the other the quickest, Bobby said as he jogged backward in front of Danny. Danny didn't reply at first. He was away with his thoughts. Something about crossing over the stone circle's perimeter had made him feel uneasy again. Bobby didn't notice, though. Yeah? You go second. Ten seconds to hide. Ultimate ninja stuff, Bobby said. But Danny could not stop thinking about those strange, unnatural symbols on the rocks. What did they mean? Who were they for? Where had he seen them before? Okay, Danny muttered. Okay, close your eyes. Danny did obediently. The world went black for a few seconds, and he walked, all the same, imagining himself coming before that strange symbol again. While Danny's eyes were locked shut, Bobby had taken off and practically dived into the bracken and gulches just off the main path. There were a few moments when Bobby could be heard scrambling around in the underbrush, then nothing. Bobby was silent and laid still under the leaves. Danny trotted on down the gravel path and reluctantly obliged his brother's masquerade. He spotted him eventually and called out to Bobby. Gotcha. No fair, Bobby said after bolting up from the bracken. You were looking. Was not. They played hide and seek for another ten minutes. When it was Danny's turn, he'd jog and hide behind a tree. When it was Bobby's turn, he went a little further and would crawl down into ditches to hide. Their parents were much further ahead now, both clearly eager to get back to the car. The forest seemed bigger to Danny. He trundled behind them by a hundred or so meters, and the trees seemed to grow bigger around him. Danny tried to ignore it and catch up to his parents while still playing with Bobby. But then, something else happened. He ran off into the woodland to the right on Bobby's last go. Danny had closed his eyes for what seemed only a few seconds. Danny listened carefully to the sounds of the wind rustling the branches all around. And then... There was a strange, vacuous silence that followed it. Three, two, one, open! Bobby had crowed from somewhere in his peripheries. Danny's eyes bulged open, and suddenly, he couldn't see anyone anymore. 
Bobby's voice then drifted off into the wind. Danny was alone. Now there was just the unending sprawl of trees before him. He stood there on the path, all of it looming down onto him. They had all disappeared. But how? His family was not a hundred meters away from him five seconds ago. He couldn't even see their shapes further down the track. Danny looked around, utterly perplexed by what had just happened. He took a few more nervous steps forward. Hello? Danny called out quietly. Bobby? Mom? Dad? They were gone. Fallen autumn leaves stirred around his feet. The wind filtered gently through the pine trees, and the trees swayed back and forth slowly all around. The path in front of him was the only path he could see. A dead straight bolt of mud and gravel carved its way through the deep and gloomy woods. Danny could see all the way down the track, but still there were no people on it. He couldn't see his family anywhere, not even Rufus the dog. Now, suddenly, Danny felt stricken with incredible anxiety and loneliness. Danny's low self-esteem made him wonder whether his family had abandoned him on purpose. Maybe Bobby had planned all along to trick Danny into shutting his eyes so they could all run away joyfully from the forest and leave him in there alone. Danny walked on alone. The fading sunlight was slanting its way through the canopies onto him. Layers of thick, milky mist swam through the pine trees, covering up everything in the middle distance. He skulked down the muddy path with his head bowed at the thought, and wondered whether they would all be waiting for him back at the car. A big joke on poor, scared little Danny. It had been almost two hours since Danny got separated from his family. He'd been ambling down that same lonely path looking for them for what felt like all day, yet the path had not changed at all. Every time Danny thought he was coming to the end of it, he looked up and saw that he could not see the forest's edge. His heart sank, and he felt like crying. The track seemingly repeated itself repeatedly in front of him like he was on a hamster's wheel. He called out a few times, but heard nothing. A small tear ran down his face. A part of him hoped that they would all spring out of the bushes gleefully and laugh at any minute having pulled a good old gag on him. Bobby would leap up with a big grin and shout, I win, you couldn't find me. But that didn't happen. Danny continued roaming forward. It was starting to get dark. The forest was growing dimmer. Shafts of light from the dying sun began to fade from white to amber and down to a mottled brown. Danny saw silhouettes of bugs flying around in the dwindling rays. It was getting colder, too. It was at this point that Danny started to feel truly terrified. What if night fell? What if he had to spend it huddled under a fallen tree? What if his mom and dad never came looking for him? A string of what-ifs swam in Danny's mind. He gulped, and the thick, heavy stone in his stomach dropped. He was finally able to articulate why he was scared of forests. It was because it was so easy to get lost in them. Danny tried to calm his racing thoughts and decided to pick up a small fallen branch. The wood was soggy and had clumps of fungus on it. To make himself feel better... He pretended the dead piece of wood in his hands was a rifle, and he was on patrol in an army. He was a soldier marching through the forests, and he was not scared. 
He gripped the length of wood and held it outstretched in front of him like he was looking down at sights. Imagining now and then that an enemy jumped out at him, and he dispatched them with a few quick shots. Danny pretended it was camouflage he had put on his rifle, so it was harder for his enemies to spot him. But that only distracted him for a little while. After another ten minutes, he tossed the stick away and sighed heavily, remembering just where he was and how utterly alone he was. Danny called out again. He shouted his parents' names. He just wanted to go home. He wanted his bed and a cup of hot chocolate. He called out for Bobby, too, but there was no reply. Danny traipsed forward. The crawling shadow that followed him since the stone circle slithered ever closer. It was almost time. After the spherule of the sun fell behind the flat wall of black trees, Danny stopped walking. He couldn't hold it in any longer. The forest was darker than he ever thought possible. Only silhouettes of the pine trees gave any sort of definition against the inky blackness of dusk. Danny cried. Tears streamed down his young and blistered face. It was almost night, and he knew that his chances of leaving the woods before then were slim. Danny stepped off the main track and went and sat on a lone tree stump in the middle of the mire. The chilly air was beginning to suck the warmth from Danny's body. He brushed the mud from his chin and tried to control his crying. He thought about what he should do. Perhaps he could use some fallen branches as a quilt? He stuffed his cold hands into the pockets of his jacket and buried his head in his chest. As he sat on the stump alone, it was then that he heard something completely out of place in a forest. A sharp clicking of metal against metal. This snapping of bolts could only come from some locking mechanism. It came from behind him. It came from the deep, dark forest at his back. Danny turned and looked over his shoulder, and there he saw something. He gasped when he did. There, against the gloom, was a frail old man standing in the underbrush. Bracken and grass blew gently around his legs. He wore a large waxed farmer's jacket and had these dirty big brown wheelies on his feet. In front of him was an old footlocker. It was a great dark thing, encased in faded black leather and wooden corners. The withered old man was locking it up in the middle of the moss-strewn forest. He craned over it and labored as he checked the first latch. Then he heaved and sat upon it like some weary traveler, scrubbing the sweat from his brows as he did. Danny sat on the tree stump and just watched him. He frowned and was curiously intrigued by this person he did not know was behind him. The old man groaned, sighed, and didn't acknowledge Danny until he spoke. Um, mister, are you okay? Danny asked the old man. When he did, the figure in the dark stood upright as if alarmed by Danny's presence. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't notice you there, the old man replied. He then continued with his task. Um... Yes, I am just fine, young man. I just... I can't get this damn thing to lock. It's running me around the ring. The old man struggled and tried to pull the second latch down to meet the lock. What is it? Danny asked, glancing down at the thick, black slab in the woods. Looks like a coffin. The old man smiled and shook his head in embarrassment. Well, it's 
all my things. It's everything I own in that wretched little chest. Danny looked around, unconvinced by the stranger's statement. But why are you in the forest with it? The old man looked up at Danny and gave an apologetic smirk. I live here. Danny frowned. You live in the woods? The curious old man nodded. Unfortunately, yes. It's the only place I can live. Why? Well, he said as he reached into his pocket and produced a cigarette. It's the only place on this earth that will have me. Danny watched as the old man struck a match and lit his cigarette. From the effulgence of the match, Danny saw the old man's face. It was a tired and tattered face. His eyes were sunken in, and his skin was wrinkled and sallow. The glazed-over sheen on his irises made Danny think of boiled eggs or something else that had faded. He was a sad old thing, and Danny felt sorry for him. Were you sitting there the whole time? Danny asked. I mean, as I was... The old man blew out a plume of smoke and looked at the floor. No. I have been dragging this thing through the trees for a long time. I only stopped here to take some rest. I didn't know anyone else was here. He looked up at Danny with an unmistakable warmth that made Danny think of his mother. The stranger's eyes glowed as he smiled sheepishly at Danny. If I'd have known, I wouldn't have disturbed you. It's okay, mister. I'm alone too. You are? The old man asked. He craned his head to look at Danny. Yeah, I was here with my family and now they're gone. Oh dear, the stranger said and raised as if perturbed by Danny's statement. Well, that's no good. Are you saying you're lost? Danny looked off into the blackness of the forest. That wall of trees rose deep, dark, and impenetrable all around him. Yeah, he said. I was with them, then we played hide-and-seek, and it was my brother's turn, and when I opened my eyes again, they were all gone. That's awful. To leave you like that. Not good. The old man snarled. I think it was a mistake. I don't think they would leave me, Danny replied apologetically. No? The old man hissed. His eyes seemed to darken. No, Bobby wouldn't do that to me. The old man laughed maniacally. <laughs> oh, oh, but he did. The old man then stood up and leered over Danny. He suddenly appeared to be very virile and full of strength, as if something had awakened within him. Danny could smell the old, crusted sweat on the man. His old eyes began to glow unnaturally, as if catching the moon's waning. The skin around his face began to move and squirm like worms were burrowing around under it. His ears twitched, and his hair started to pulsate. You don't think your family left you? Well, let's prove it. The old man took hold of Danny's wrist and pulled him a few steps forward. He twisted it unmercifully as he tugged Danny deeper into the woods. Ow! You're hurting me, mister, Danny said. Malcolm! I've got your boy. He's here with me. Come here and I'll give him to you. He's here with me. The stranger screamed upward into the night sky. He bellowed and shouted banshee-like at the stars like some deranged rabid wolf. Malcolm! I've got your boy. Get him. Come try to get him. Stop it, mister. Danny squawked. You're scaring me. As the old man yanked him further into the trees, 
Danny smelt the stench of the stranger even more. This loathsome stink radiated from under his jacket. The old man smelled like a marsh. It was a harsh concoction of tobacco smoke, cider, creosote, and mud. Danny tried to wriggle away from his grasp, but the stranger clenched tighter. Let me go! Danny shouted. What do you want? The old man looked down at him. His eyes smoldered now, like fiery coals locked in a furnace. Oh, don't be scared, my boy. It's not like your family has abandoned you or anything. They haven't. My mom's right over there. The old man leaned in further. Are they? Have they not left you? Answer me this, little lone lamb. If your family cares for you so much, why are you standing here alone in the marsh? Because I ran off. The old man snarled. <sighs> ran off you did. But you touched the stone back there, and I came for you. And you know what, little lost lamb? What? Danny answered meekly. I am so hungry. You know, I have been in here for a long time. I have not had a decent meal for years. I am so ravenous that I could literally feast upon the bark of trees. The stranger then cocked his head downward at poor little lost Danny. Danny looked up at the stranger's face in the darkness. I think your guts would taste pretty good right now, the old man said. I'd like to chew on your entrails, my boy. No, Danny whimpered. Danny reeled back and tried to escape. He pulled his arm away from the old man, but the dark presence loomed down upon him. It's not like your family will miss you, is it? After all, they left you here. The old man crowed. He then leaned in and sniffed Danny. Soon, like all the others, you shall live in that chest. Your soul will belong to me forever. No, get off of me! Danny yelped. The old man's face peeled back from his skull. Underneath the flap of skin was a pale surface made of writhing tentacles. Down the middle of the skull was a slit that was its mouth. It opened up sideways. Danny screeched. He stared up, utterly horrified at the churning mass of worms where the old man's face used to be. Danny's screams echoed up into the night, but no one heard them. A police constable discovered the remains of Danny just after sunrise on that cold, wet autumn day that changed the family's lives forever. The police had been scouring the woods all night with sniffer dogs, and one of them had found the scene just after dawn. Just off the main track, there was a small puddle of blood. Sitting in it was Danny's ripped-up coat. There was nothing else to find. Danny's family had reported him missing that evening and had joined the police search party throughout the night. When PC Nolan found the remains in the morning, he refused to let any of the family see them. He ordered the other constables to usher the family away and get them back to the car. It was something wholly unnatural and not fit for anyone to look at. He remained and knelt in the underbrush, trying to maintain his composure as he looked down at the horror. 
The blood was gloopy and somehow bubbling like a saucer of gravy over a stove. P.C. Nolan shuddered. What on earth has done that? He whispered to himself as he looked down at the pool of simmering primordial blood. Later that day, the forest was cordoned off, and it was all over the local news. Police officers stood in the rain around the perimeter, and forensics were in and out of the scene. There was nothing to find. No one could stomach the investigation. The case would be the end of many of the detectives' careers. There was a large token funeral for Danny a week later. The whole town came out to show their support for the troubled family. The police never found anything, and the local folk could only speculate as to what killed Danny. The local folk shudder even to think that something could ever happen in their area. The years drew by like a knife, and everyone but the family slowly forgot about Danny's horrific disappearance, mainly out of fear they all chose not to acknowledge such an event. Everyone but the family forgot about Danny. Everyone but Bobby. It has been 35 years since Danny was murdered, and Bobby has never stopped looking for the killer. Driven by an insatiable rage-filled desire to solve it, Bobby soon joined the Devonshire Police Force, it did not take long for him to be promoted to Detective Chief Inspector. Now, 35 years later, on the anniversary of Danny's death, DCI Robert Bobby Vine knows who, or more to the point, what killed his baby brother all those years ago. After exhausting every lead and ruling out every other suspect, all his research and investigation now point to only one possibility. When the sun sets over Dartmoor, he will go back into that forest to confront it. Early morning mist wraps the Texas highway like a burial shrub. A red BMW emerges from the fog behind us. I hold my breath and squint to see the license plate in the vanity mirror. It's from Colorado. I breathe out and lean back in my seat. So, when are we gonna talk? I pull my eyes from the mirror, but I can't look at David. It was my idea to move to Salem, my curiosity that led me to that book club. When we're safe in Mexico, the lie comes as a hoarse whisper. There is no safe place. Not anymore. His blue eyes glance at me only briefly before his hand leaves the wheel and finds my knee. I feed my fingers between his and his focus returns to the road. He says nothing. He never does. My husband. His silent support is always there, lending me strength, respecting my freedom. For five years we've been on this journey together. If only I could tell him the truth. David points out a sign as we pass. We'll need gas in Bastrop. His hand tightens on mine. And maybe something real to eat? Every ounce of me screams no. We can't stop. Not until we pass beyond their reach. Please? He flashes me that look. Those puppy dog eyes. I can already feel my resolve crumbling. We've been so careful. Stayed off the main roads eaten gas station food and paid only with cash. There's no way they should be able to find us. But what if I'm wrong? They know he's my weakness, my whole world. I know he's the one who will pay if they find us. I don't know. We're so close. He elbows my arm and nods at a sign just off the road. They have an It's a Burger. I cough out a laugh. That's real food? Sure. His eyebrows waggle and I can't keep from laughing. He acts like we're teenagers on a road trip. But he's already pushed himself beyond endurance without even knowing why. My heart aches. That's who he is. That's why I love him. 
I told him I was in trouble, that we needed to leave. He didn't ask or argue. He simply shuffled behind the wheel and drove. 30 hours later, and he's still driving. No questions asked. He's amazing. Okay, I take in the dark circles creeping in under his eyes and the last of my resistance melts away. He's given me his all. But only if we get it to go, then I'm driving. I should tell him, but he'd never understand. To him, witchcraft is herbs, psychology, and sleight of hand. Something I do for fun. He has no idea the promotion, the new house, even his cancer going into remission last year was me. All of it, me. Consulting spirits, casting charms, making our lives better. Magic. At a price I didn't, couldn't pay. He pulls into the lot. I scan the license plates as quickly as I can. None are from Massachusetts. Of course not. I'm overreacting. My legs ache when I stand. The scent of overcooked hamburger hangs heavy in the air, and I'm acutely aware of my need for the ladies' room. David smiles at my little dance and takes my purse. Cheeseburger? I'm already halfway to the door. And sweet tea. I shiver as I enter the lobby. The air conditioner must be working overtime, but nobody else seems to notice. I find the restroom and open the door. A movement in the corner of my eye draws my attention to the mirror. As I watch, a name appears written in the condensation on the glass. David. I blink, and it's gone, wiped clean by an invisible hand. My heart stops. They found us. My hands shake as I fumble with the door latch. We have to leave now. I smash my shoulder against the door. It bursts open just as a man shouts, In a restaurant? That's just nasty. David! I scream, sprinting to the crowd gathering at the register. But he's not there. Behind the counter, a mouse darts across a steel table by the fryer. Light glistens against something on its paw. I only catch a glimpse but it's a gold wedding band. David. I shove my way forward and dive, reaching for him. David, it's me. But he doesn't recognize me. He bolts. For a moment, his body hangs frozen above the boiling oil. Then, time slams into motion. The scent of burning hair fills my nostrils. My legs crumple. Everyone is screaming. But they're not. It's just me. And I can't stop. I sit cross-legged on the bed, staring out at the yellow glow of the streetlights shimmering like stars against the pouring rain. Numb. Broken. Watching the world through a hotel window. Bastra. I know I should have driven on. There's no guarantee they won't target me next. But... I sniff and pull the blankets over my head like a cloak. There's no point. Everything I did... Every spell I cast was for him. And now, my chest burns. I wipe a tear from my cheek just as the clock on the nightstand flashes to 3 a.m. It's time. I take a deep breath and stretch out with my feelings. A soft tingle brushes against my cheek, the familiar touch of his wing. Raven, my spirit guide's way of letting me know he's come. They found me, I whisper letting my eyes drift to the top of the television where I know he's perched. Invisible. David's gone. They... But all I get out is a whimpering hum as I bury my face in my palms. David, I'm so sorry. My keys fall off the nightstand. Raven. I swallow the lump in my throat and stare at the place I know he is. What are you saying? He doesn't answer. Of course not. He's a spirit. I wipe my nose in the blanket and glare at him. Can't you just say something? Just once? I know that's not how spirits work, but hate having to piece everything together, and I'm really not in the mood. When he doesn't answer, I roll my eyes and lean over the side of the bed. But the way my keys are sprawled out tells me everything I need to know. Four keys spread out in a cross, with the fifth in the center sticking straight up. A queen kunks a hoodoo sigil of protection. My heart stops. It's a warning. He's telling me I'm in danger, but he's wrong. 
We made a blood pact. We can't harm each other. That's why they went after... Raven taps his beak on the top of the television, interrupting my thoughts. I made a blood pact. I whisper, still staring at my keys. I'm an idiot. They have my blood. That's how they found him. A simple scrying spell, using my blood as a focus. I blink up at the top of the television. But the pact. They can't break a blood pact. Not without... A human sacrifice. David. It was poetic. Efficient. My blood betraying my heart crushing my soul and voiding the contract all in one ritual, torturing me before the kill, like a cat playing with a mouse. Hands trembling, I dive for my suitcase. There's not much left. I used all my charms to keep David safe, to keep him hidden. It never occurred to me to protect myself, that they'd find him through me. I rip open the zipper and fumble through the bag of herbs I keep for emergencies. Rosemary, salt, Enough for now. Crushing the ingredients together in my palms, I mumble the best incantation I can remember and dump a sprinkle of dust on the floor at each corner of the bed. Then I reach under the bed and drop the rest in a pile under the center of the mattress, finishing the quincunks. Thank you, Raven. I brush the dust from my hands and dig my grimoire out of the suitcase. I don't know why they waited to strike, but they missed their chance. And now, I only have one reason to live. To make them pay. One by one. Rosemary. Time. I sigh and glance down the aisle of bins of granola, flour, and other organic foodstuffs. I don't know what I expected. A better herb section, I guess. But for now, this will have to do. I dump the thyme in the little plastic bag and slip the scoop back in its holder. Most of the essential equipment shouldn't be hard to come by, and I'm not entirely unprepared. I have my kit, my focus stones, and whatnot. What I'm lacking is ingredients. David. My chest burns. I had everything I needed. Everything. I used every spell, every charm I could think of to keep him safe. I planned everything. I knew Deb would be using her grandpa's map to track us. She had to have an emotional connection with it in order for the spell to work. If only we hadn't stopped. A little girl in a sparkly pink princess dress steps around the end of the shelves. Oh, with raspberries. I choke down the lump caught in my throat as I watch her bounce to a bin and glance back at the end of the aisle. Mommy. Hold on, sweetie. A woman on her phone pushes a cart around the corner, mumbling something about needing to reschedule. Don't forget your brother. I won't. The little girl stands on her tiptoes to reach the scoop. Mother and daughter. My throat aches. Twisting the charm around my wrist, I watch the girl's face knot into a scowl as she fights to shake the scoop free. It's her freckles, the way her curly red hair bounces as she moves the blue ribbons struggling for all their might to keep in contained. I can't look away. She could have been mine. Pressure builds behind my eyes. I could have been her mother. She stretches out as far as she can, hops on her tiptoes and huffs. I can't reach it, mommy. The mother rolls her eyes, still speaking into the phone. Well, see if Frank can make it. Without looking, she reaches over, slips the scoop free of the holder and hands it to her daughter. Then that's her problem. The bow holding one of the girl's pigtails slips loose, as if waiting to escape her hair explodes instantly in a giant red poof. She freezes for a second, scoop still buried in the bin, and then, almost in slow motion, reaches up and slips the loose ribbon from the tangle on her head and stares at it. Mommy, it happened again. The mother glances at her daughter, smirks, then squats down, pinching her phone between her head and shoulder. I'm gonna sew these in, I swear. She finishes tying back her daughter's hair and taps her on the nose. My chin trembles and I turn away. She could have been mine. We could have had a family. David said he wanted a girl, a little girl with pigtails. A soft tickle trails down my cheek. 
I brush it away, but my fingers come back wet. I'm crying. I shake my head, forcing myself out of the moment. I can't do this. I can't let myself get distracted. I need to punish them for what they took. I owe it to him. To David. Clenching my jaw, I glance down at the list in my hand. I need a pack of needles and red thread, never been used. That part shouldn't be a problem, but I'll need to find a thrift star. I need a cloth of memory and heartbreak. Again, simple. Almost everything in secondhand store is full of memory. The candles, on the other hand, are going to be a little tricky. I need five, and they have to be made of fat, not wax. Absently, I search the wall for the meat sign. Those I can manage, hopefully, assuming the butcher doesn't trim lean. But the final ingredient is going to be more of a problem. Blood, human blood, just a little, and it can't be mine. I stuff the list in my purse and march toward the craft section to find my needles and thread. Looks like I'm going to need to ask Raven for a favor. Closing the door behind me, I drop my purse on the counter by the TV and set the bags down on the bed. It took most of the day to track down everything, but I managed to piece it all together, even refill most of my reserves. I pull my kit out from under my pillow, open the lid, and spread the altar cloth out over the bed. Raven may be my guide, but he gets cranky if I don't take the time to do everything just right. So I need to lay out what I'm planning, every ingredient, so he can get a good look at each. Herbs around the edge, focus items in the center, and I tap my chin. I need something shiny just for him to look at. My gaze lands on my purse. Keys. That'll do it. I dig them out and drop them in the center and pull the reading lamp around so they sparkle. Better. I glance down at my watch, quarter to twelve. Raven doesn't like being summoned before midnight, and I don't want to irritate him. Not when I need a favor. But patience was never my thing. And I have fifteen minutes. I pick at a loose piece of skin by my thumbnail. What am I going to do for fifteen minutes? My spell jar. I slip the silver chain over my head, unscrew the top of the tiny glass bottle fastened to the clasp, and dump the contents into my palm. Now that I have fresh herbs to work with, I can upgrade the enchantment. Adding sea salt and a few sprigs of wormwood, I offer a prayer to the goddess and slide the charm back around my neck. I don't know if she'll hear me. Deborah was the high priestess of our coven, but the gods are fickle. I settle down on the foot of the bed beside my ingredients, fold my legs to clear my mind. Besides, Raven is a messenger of the goddess. If she had abandoned me, he wouldn't have come. He wouldn't have warned me. The clock on the nightstand flashes 12 a.m. It's time. I lay the backs of my hands on my knees, press my fingers together, and stretch out with my mind. Raven, hear me. I beseech thee. Nothing changes exactly, but the air, the energy of the room, ripples. A soft tickle brushes against my cheek, and on the edge of hearing, Raven Cause. He's here. Goosebumps prickle down my arms. Raven, dread guide and messenger of the Shadow Realm, here are the sacrifices I offer. I ask only that you aid me in my quest for justice. Just beyond sight, I sense Raven puff out his chest and hop over to my altar cloth. He swaggers between the arrangement, prods the wedding veil with his beak, and ruffles his feathers. My chest relaxes. He's pleased. I ask your guidance. I must strike them all as one, lest they slip from my grasp. Will you help me? How do I attain the blood I need? Raven tips his head, blinks at each item in turn, and shrieks so loud I almost hear him with my physical ears. I wince, but his meaning is clear. My spell isn't strong enough, even with the blood. No... A voice croaks in my mind, sending my fingernails into my palms. Dark deeds cannot be performed by creatures of the light, he says. Do not take this path. But I must. My eyes burn. He's never spoken to me before. Not like this. Only in riddles and half-guessed feelings. I didn't even know he could do this. I can't let them get away with this. I'll do anything. I wince at the pressure building at the base of my skull. Anything you say, please help me. Justice. Raven sighs. 
always mortals willingly go. I hoped you were different. He hops over my needles and thread. So be it. You seek their blood? Then go. Find a creature of innocence, a beast that has done harm to no one. Take it to the cemetery. There, break its neck as a sacrifice to the goddess and spill out its blood on the freshly dug grave you will find there. Then, and only then, I will know you are truly willing to walk the path of vengeance. Two in the morning, I squint at the etching on the headstone. Jose Garcia, born June 12, 1924, died September 2, 2019, the same day as David. My eyes burn and I look away. Raven? I should have known. What happens in the physical world and the spirit realms are connected. Magic is all about seeing the threads that bind, using them to weave our own tapestry. Pulling my cuff into my hand, I brush the fresh dirt smooth with my sleeve. The spell requires blood, the blood of vengeance, the blood of the victim, an innocent who died a violent death. David's blood. But David has no body, none I could use, so I need to improvise. And that's where Frank comes in. Kneeling before the stone, I press a single candle into the dirt at the base of the headstone, take two candles in each hand, spread out my arms, and stare up at the moon. Spiritus venti et cali, exaudi orentanium miom, exaudi clarumem miom, ut iustita restuetur et moriotur rius. Spirit of the wind and sky, hear my prayer, hear my cry, that justice be restored and the guilty die. Yin and yang, push and pull, light and dark, Justice is woven into the very fabric of the universe, balance in all things. Timete deum justeta, sororis prefixe sunt libra, fact me cohesio procium tuum, gladium tuum. Dread God of justice, my sisters have tipped the scale. I beg you, make me your arm, your sword. Vita as vitam, in Beside me, the rabbit I bought at the pet store earlier digs at the floor of his plastic carrier. My voice falters. In, in innocentia solvid pro innocentia capta. Life for life, innocence paid for innocence taken. A soft breeze lifts my hair. A cold chill races across my skin, chasing a shiver down my spine. The spirits have come. They're watching. Without looking down, I reach back with both hands and press two candles into the dirt behind me. David's death was without justice, without balance, and balance must be restored. That is the way of things, the law of all magic. I plunge the other two into the ground by my knees, finishing the points of the star, reach into my jacket, pull out the palm-sized silver bowl I use for spell work, and place it between my knees. Innocentia pro innocentia. The spirits demand it. I slip my little brass dagger from its sheath on my forearm and plunge it into the ground beside the bowl. A lead ball sticks in the back of my throat. Somehow, I manage to swallow it down, open the cage, grab the rabbit by the ears, and hold him up against the light of the moon. He kicks, and my hand lowers. It's David. The rabbit represents David. Its blood will be David's as far as the spirits are concerned which means, symbolically, I'm the coven. I'm killing David. A sob rakes through my chest. I can't do it. Even as a parody, I can't do it. Do you think Deborah, Kathy, and Allison felt remorse at what they had done? I glance over at the top of the headstone where Raven is sitting, like a shadow in the night, watching me. No, they rejoiced. After your beloved David died, they went to Gibraltar's for cocktails to celebrate. Celebrate? The rabbit kicks, and I have to grab his body with my other hand so he doesn't wriggle free. I know. I saw. I sat outside the window. I watched your sisters raise a toast to your pain, your suffering, to their own cleverness at taking your love. 
Raven flaps his wings and hops to the edge of the headstone. Would you allow this injustice to go unpunished? Would show them mercy? He twists his head to stare at me with his other eye. Would you defy the goddess who demands justice at your hand? Would you sacrifice the spirit of your love? Deny him vengeance from the world beyond? No, I whimper. I won't let his spirit will wander forever, searching for the justice he'll never find. A restless spirit, a ghost. My heart cracks. I can't let that happen. I won't. No, I'll do it. Jaw clenched, I hold the rabbit up to the light of the moon. For David. I grip the rabbit's body in one hand and the back of his head in the other. Sanguis pro sanguin. I close my eyes. There isn't much noise when I twist, just a soft crackling pop and the deed is done. The rabbit kicks on for a while, it makes cutting him open difficult, and I don't get all the blood in the bowl, but enough to draw the pentagram with and a little extra. Enough for what I need. I light the candles one by one, offering a prayer to the goddess as each one sparks to life. Raven sits on the edge of the headstone, watching silently until the ritual is complete. But once the candles are out, after I've poured the blood into one of my little jars, pocketed his teeth, and buried the remains, he taps his beak against the stone. It is done. Your path is set, servant of the goddess. I give him a sharp nod as thanks and stuff my spell kit into my duffel bag. But I don't want his praise. I just want this nightmare to end. I want David back. Are you prepared for tomorrow? My hand freezes in the bag. Tomorrow? Three and three must always be equal in power and unity. Dark as light to those who see behind the bale of secrecy. My shoulders slump. The scrying eye. I forgot. It can only be cast once every three days, which is why there are always at least three witches in a coven. So we're never vulnerable. But Deb didn't want equals. She wanted to rule, and so she kept some spells to herself. There's no way Kathy and Allison can cast it. It has to be Deb, and tomorrow is the third day since David... A lump rises in my throat. I see, Raven grumbles. Then there is no time. Remember, mortals see through eyes tainted by hopes and fear. He ruffles his feathers, jumps from the stone, and flies off to wherever he goes when he's not here. It doesn't matter. Numbly, I jam my arm through the strap of my bag and slump back to the car. I know what I have to do. A single shaft of sunlight angles in through the crack between the curtains of my hotel room. It streams across my body as I watch the tiny flecks of dust float aimlessly in the light. Watching. Waiting. All at once, the flecks dance and swirl like leaves in a stream, moved by whatever ethereal currents stir them. My heart skips the next beat. Deb's here. Now. Watching. Blank-faced, I stare at the window and surrender to the pain. Numb, broken, David's suitcase lies beside me on the bed, his clothes wrapped in my arms just so I can feel him again, smell him again. The alarm clock on the nightstand flashes two in the afternoon, twelve hours since I completed the ritual, nearly twelve more until I can summon Raven again. Shaking my head, I push away the thought and replay the nightmare in my mind one more time. David's body suspended in time, caught mid-air over the vat of boiling oil. I tremble and press time back into motion, his body splashed into the fryer. My chest throbs, but I don't move on. I go back to the moment I saw the mirror and watch it all over again. I haven't slept, I haven't eaten in days. Not since David... My chin trembles. I clutch his folded straight razor to my chest just to feel it in my hands to have a piece of him near me. The last time I saw him with it, he was standing by the sink at home, running this blade over his leather strop. It always sent goosebumps down my arms, seeing the knife at his neck. I hated it. I hated the size of it. I hated how it looked against his throat. 
I bought him countless razors and electric shavers, hoping he'd trade, but he never did. You can't beat the quality, he said, while I stood in the doorway, heart pounding as he stretched out his neck and slid the blade down his skin. There is such a thing as too close, you know, I winced. Oh? David smirked into the mirror. I always thought I had the perfect face for headless. I folded my arms over my chest. That's not funny. It's a little funny. Laying the razor on the edge of the sink, his eyebrow cocked. I mean, you don't want me to give you a rug burn, do you? But I knew that look. No, I said, backing away. Ugh, he groaned, lather dripping from his chin. I think I've gone rabid. No, you don't. I turned to run, but it was too late. His hand caught mine before I even made it out of the door. David, don't you dare. I squealed as he spun me around. David! I threw my hands over my face to shield myself, but he went for my neck instead. Outside, a car's honk pulls me from the memory. I flipped the latch on the razor, exposing the blade and swallow. It really is beautiful. Ancient, but beautiful. I close it again and hold it close. David had to be the only man alive that still used one, but that was him. Unique. Special. God, I miss him. I sniff and go back to blankly staring at the curtain, the empty windowsill I swept clean of salt. Outside, the noise of traffic rumbles on, the low thrum of people going about their lives as if nothing changed. The world spins on without me, without him, as if he never mattered at all. The rhythm of life. There's no use trying to fight it. My thumb strokes the side of his razor. One flower dies only to have its place taken by another. Threads cut, threads retied, and life goes on without a pause. What's the point? Everything we think is important. Nothing. Our deaths, not even a pause in the circle of life. Why bother? Why not end it now? With his razor, we could be together like Romeo and Juliet, together in paradise. The edges of the curtain sway and the flecks of dust swirling in the light go back to floating limp in the air, the way dust should. I lay there a few more moments longer, but when I'm sure Deb's gone, I toss David's razor back in the suitcase, dig out the salt, and pour a thin line on the windowsill. Three days since her last scrying spell, three days before she can cast another. And what did Deb find? A depressed, suicidal woman suffering alone in agony. Exactly what she was hoping for. Turning back to my bag, I fish out my spell jar and slip the charm around my wrist, but it's hardly necessary. If I know Deb, she won't lift a finger against me now. As far as she's concerned, the longer I suffer, the better. But her turn is coming. I flop down on the bed, crack open my spell kit and go over the ingredients one last time. I already know I'm ready. Now doubly so. She won't suspect a thing. None of them will. Bins of bulk food tower around me like canyon walls, so high I can't see the top. Monkeys screech at one another somewhere high above me and jawbreakers bounce off the linoleum, falling like rain. I pull the collar of my jacket up over my head to shield myself, but a familiar tingle ripples down my back. Not now, I hiss and bolt to take shelter under a tree that sprouted from the walnut bin. I tried to take a nap after Dev left, but I couldn't sleep. Until now, apparently, since I'm dreaming. Shaking the jawbreakers out of my pockets, I glance up at the pink sky, reminding myself that we humans are creatures of two realms, the physical and the ethereal. When we're awake in the real world, we live in the dreams of our ethereal half. And our dreams are simply our ethereal side waking up in the spirit realm. The scent of cotton candy hangs in the air like fog, stinging my nose. I don't remember falling asleep, but it's not all bad. Holding out my hand, I catch one of the jawbreaker raindrops and pop it in my mouth. I was sitting on the edge of my bed, sewing the veil I bought into little dolls. One for Deborah, one for Kathy, and one for Allison. But David's here somewhere. I push the drawbreaker between my teeth, stare out into the dim green canyon, and sigh. Maybe he'll be drawn to me. Maybe. Unless he already crossed back into the waking world. 
The thought sends my heart racing. I can see him now, wandering the streets of Bastrop without a physical form, alone, frightened, unable to speak, unable to touch, a ghost. The thought makes my jaw clench, shattering jawbreaker between my teeth. The taste of mashed potatoes fills my senses. It congeals over my tongue in a thick, sticky goo. I have to wake up. I have to finish the spell before he gets to the physical plane. If I have to summon his spirit and perform an exorcism to put him to rest, things are going to get really complicated. I stretch the goo over my tongue and blow into a bubble. It floats out into the jawbreaker hailstorm and pops, releasing a giant fluff ball of red curly hair. It falls to the ground and rolls to the wall of bulk food bins just as the storm passes. Two legs sprout from the underside of the hairball, followed by the hem of a sparkling pink princess dress. And before I know what's happening, the girl from the market stands up and tugs at her hair, trying to tie him back with a blue ribbon. Hello, she giggles and tips her head as she pulls. Can you tie bows? Sure. I walk over to lend a hand. One of the first things I learned studying magic is that because we live between worlds, we never see the truth in either place. The real world is just as distorted by the memories of our spirit side as our dreams by our waking memories. Whatever this spirit is, she's not the girl from the store. My mind sensed something she has in common with the girl, and so that's what I see. Taking the ends of the ribbon, I cross them over and gently pull it tight around her hair. How's that? Too tight? Nope, it's good. She hands me the other ribbon. I take it and pull the rest of her hair into another tail on the other side of her head. I was wondering. I pause as I tie the bow. Have you seen a man around here asking for me? She might not know. She could be anything, sprite or a wisp, or an incarnation of the goddess herself. In any case, it can't hurt to ask. You mean David? My heart stops. You know David? Do you know where he is? Yes. She spins around, staring at me like I just asked if her hair was red. He helped me get some gummy worms. David's here. My chest burns. I have to find him. Where is he? Gone. Gone? I don't understand. Gone where? To find you. No. Did he? I swallow hard. Did he find a doorway? No. She looks down and tugs at the hem of her dress. Raven took... What? A loud caw shrieks, cutting her off. I glance up in time to see Raven perched on the lowest branch of the walnut tree and fix his black eyes on me. What are you doing here? I... I fell asleep. I sputter. I didn't mean to. Hmm. He stretches his wing to adjust a feather with his beak. You fell asleep. He blinks, seeming to notice the girl for the first time. Ah. She shrinks behind me, putting my body between her and Raven. Threads be here and justice there. Raven lowers his head and spreads wings in a way that makes my neck hairs prickle. Cut one thread to make it fair. I flinch, but the girl steps out from behind my legs. Please. She holds out her wrist, showing Raven the rune etched into her skin, the outline of a fish pointing up as if standing on its tail, the rune for bloodline and inheritance, the Othilla. I have a family. You be hers, so she be in you. Sins of the mother are all imbued. The innocent taken, innocence lost. His voice lowers to a whisper. Blood is required. That is the cost. The girl lowers her arm, but when I look at her again, her hair is darker, her nose and cheeks not as round. I blink, but it isn't the girl from the market. It's Alex. It's Deb's daughter. She turns her face to me, but where her eyes should be, two empty sockets full of maggots stare blankly up at me. I stumble back, my heart pounding in my throat. Wasted, Raven shouts so loud the word echoes like thunder against the bins. So much hope lost. Wake. 
dragging the word out in a lingering hiss. The bark under his feet smooths into scales. Spin the accursed wheel. My back slams into the bins on the opposite side of the canyon. It's not just his perch. Every twig, every branch slithers. Every leaf watches me with golden eyes. Snakes. I can't breathe. He's sitting in a tree of snakes. Behold the harvest. He throws his wings wide and bodies drop from the canopy, dangling like fruit by hangman's noose. Dozens of them, hundreds of them. My head spins. Something soft presses against my cheek and my whole body jerks. Heart pounding, I jolt up, covered in sweat. But I'm awake. I'm back. I'm in the physical world. Tossing the doll aside, I grab a pen and paper from my kit and scribble down everything I can remember before it fades away. I don't know if I'll be able to make sense of it, but I have to try. I have to follow the threads. Raven. It's been hours since I woke, but my hands still shake as I stuff the last of dried herbs into the final doll, stitch her closed. Snipping off the red thread, I toss a glance at the clock on the nightstand. 2.30. I lay her down beside Deborah and Kathy's effigies inside my kit and take a deep breath to try to settle my thoughts. It's not unusual for spirits to take animal form. They do it all the time. Some cultures even call them animal guides. They're supposed to protect you, give you insight, and wisdom. But... The image of Raven sitting in the tree of snakes presses in on me. I shake my head to clear the memory. This is ridiculous. I'm a witch. I know how to interpret dreams. It was the first thing I researched after Raven came to me. I can still quote the passage. Ravens, while often regarded as a bad omen in Western society, in dreams represent transformation and opportunity. They are intermediaries between the material and spirit worlds, creative and playful. Ravens can represent a return to a more youthful exuberance. Picking up the spool of thread, I tuck it away in my case, remembering how happy when I read those words. I smile as I slip the needles back in their pouch and drop them in beside the thread. If only all messages from the spirit world were that easy to decipher. A tree of snakes can mean nothing, danger from multiple enemies or awakening. A raven with a snake can mean healing or triumph over danger. A raven with spread wings means a major change. Adjusting his feathers like raven did is usually an omen of death. I sniff and snap the sewing section of my kit closed, trying not to think about the bodies. I think death is probably a safe bet. And I do have multiple enemies. Three of them. I'm about to send them to the shadows, so death and major life changes. It all fits. It's just... <laughs> I toss the scissors in with the iron knife and sharpening stone. That's the first time Raven ever acted like that. The first time he ever scared me, even in a dream. And I know the druids didn't trust him. It's all over their mythology. Raven, or Fittik, as they called him, is a trickster, selfish, vain. Sometimes helpful, but other times vindictive and mischievous, like Loki. But then again, Odin had two, Hugin and Munin. They flew back and forth between worlds, serving as his eyes on Earth. My stomach growls, reminding me that I haven't eaten in four days. I don't feel like it, but I need to eat. I'm no good to David if I can't move. Closing the lid on my spell kit, I fasten the latch and slip it under my pillow, but I can't get the image out of my head. I don't know what it is exactly, but something doesn't feel right. I just can't put my finger on what... I glance down at the frayed end of a piece of thread I trimmed off of one of the dolls. Red, like the girl's hair. My fingers go numb. Deceit. In dreams, red-haired girls always mean deceit. My head throbs. That doesn't help. I'm deceiving Deborah. It could just mean... No, the canyon, the bins, the jawbreakers, the whole dream was about her and she had a binding rune on her wrist. I'm the one being deceived. Unless... My stomach pinches. It doesn't matter. I need food, and I need to find a place to work. Some place I can set up an altar. Some place thick with loss and despair. Snatching my purse off the nightstand, I slip on my shoes 
and head for the door. I hate dreams anyway. What's the point of going to the spirit world if all they give you is vague cryptic messages that could mean anything? I drive aimlessly for an hour before I find an old abandoned farmhouse on the edge of town, the kind with the cellar doors on the outside. The roof is caved in, but from what I can tell from the road, the basement should be intact enough. It'll work. I turn around at the end of the driveway and head back into Bastrop to find some food. I can't go into the restaurant, not after what happened to David, so I pull through the drive through of some local sub shop instead. The weather's nice, sunny, warm, only a handful of clouds hovering like balls of cotton scattered on a sapphire sea. The perfect day for eating outside. It's already after five when I sit down on a park bench and open my sandwich. A few kids are on the playground across the pond. Their mothers stand in a tight group off to the side gossiping, oblivious to anything but their conversation. As mothers do, I roll back the paper and take a bite. Vinegar, oregano, basil. I glance down at the seasoning on the bread. It's a curious thing how much witchcraft people use every day without knowing it. How much passes without notice? I close my eyes and drink it all in. The taste of onion, tomato, and mayonnaise on my tongue. The lap of little ripples splashing against the shore. The gentle rustle of leaves in the trees overhead. The musty scent of the pond. And the way it mixes with the scents of Bastrop. A high-pitched laugh in the distance opens my eyes. Almost as one, the mothers cover their mouths, laughing at some joke or bit of gossip blind to the magic all around them, oblivious to the sun on their skin, the laughs of their children, all of it. I swallow and take another bite, but my eyes burn. How many moments did I spend like that with David? Oblivious? How much magic did I miss? How much was taken? We could have had a family, future. That's all I wanted, to be a wife, a mother. Deborah. My chest aches and I rip the next bite free. It was one spell, one, and I'm the one who read it, not David. It wasn't his fault, none of it. Not that I couldn't get pregnant, not that none of the doctors we saw could help, not the price Deborah demanded in exchange for the fertility spell, and it wasn't David that snuck into her sanctum and copied it from her grimoire. It was me, all of it, me, not him, me. One of the kids pops out of the end of the slide. She ducks, about to run around one side, but pivots and darts the other way as another girl rounds the corner chasing her. A little red-haired girl. I stop chewing. It's the same girl from the market, from my dream. Bastrop isn't that small. It can't be a coincidence. Someone, some spirit, is trying to tell me something. A soft flutter pulls my attention to a trash can chained to a post a little further down the path where a raven is playing tug-of-war with a couple of blue jays over some bit of garbage. You're it! The boy screams and vanishes behind the slide, squealing. The girl takes off after him, but her foot slips and she slams into the side of the slide, hard enough the thud carries all the way across the pond. I wince and my gaze flicks to the mother's, but she's already on the move, running. I finish chewing, swallow, and take another bite, almost as if she was the one who was hurt. Othila, I whisper, but I think I understand my dream now. I was so focused on the pain, on David, that I didn't realize what Deborah actually took. They didn't just kill David. They took my life, my children, my future, my Othila, everything. Killing them isn't enough. Shaking, I toss the rest of my sandwich to the Jays. It's not enough. Justice means balancing the scales. That's what the goddess demands. They need to suffer the same fate. Innocentia pro innocentia. I snatch my purse from the bench and hurry back to the car. They started this, not me. And by the goddess, they'll live to regret it. It's midnight before I head back to the farmhouse. The broken silhouette stands against the moonlight like the carcass of some long dead, long forgotten beast. I swallow and pull my car deep into the underbrush. It's so overgrown, I don't think anyone's been here in decades, but the last thing I need is interruptions. Clutching my kit to my chest, I make my way through the darkness. No flashlight, no light at all. 
tonight, the darkness is my ally. The stairs creak under my weight as I descend into the cellar and set my kit down on the floor. Spiritus timores et tenebra exodi me, veni ad me. Spirit of dread and darkness, hear me, come to me. Only then do I reach into the pocket of my robe, pull out one of the candles I had prepared, and light it. The dancing light brings the broken beams and rubble out of the darkness. Two walls are completely caved in, but the west wall, the one I need, is still intact. I wedge the candle into the dirt on the floor, pick up a few loose stones and stack them in two piles, and lay some of the broken boards on top. Stepping back from the altar, I can't help but smile. Moss hangs in sheets from the crumbling stone wall, the moonlight angling in through the cracks in the floor above me, thick with the air of forgotten memories and broken dreams. I couldn't have asked for a better place. I toss my altar cloth over the boards, lay out my silver bowl, the effigies of Deborah, Kathy, and Allison, along with all the ingredients I'll need. Dia noctus, susurus mortis, audicosa, mean pro iuas dita, squame, tiu av brxvexe sunt, quaso, modo utis, deno ex quarant. Goddess of night, whisper of death, hear my plea for justice. Your scales have been tipped. I beg only to set them level once more. Pouring the rabbit's blood, ritually David's blood, into the silver bowl, I pull back my sleeve and dip a thin brush into the half-congealed mats. Nulla labus in sanguinqui effusis est lustita in morte nulla. There is no taint in the blood that was spilled, no justice in his death. Taking each effigy in turn, I paint their hands red with David's blood. Sanguis ius in minibus est. His blood is on their hands. I dip the brush in blood once more and paint the Othilla on their chests, per familias suas, on their family's hands. I take the needles I use to sew the dolls and dump them in the bowl of blood. Next, I sprinkle in a pack of rat poison, the rabbit's teeth, the match I used to light the candle, and few maggots I found in the garbage behind the hotel, pausing to set up and light a candle as I add each item. Once all the candles are lit, I take the brass dagger in both hands and stab the mixture three times, once for Allison, once for Kathy, once for Deborah. Before I even lift my blade from the third stroke, the candles sputter and die. And so it is done. Raven croaks and all the candles reignite. The wheel spins on. I pull my dagger from the blood and he hops down from the shadows onto the altar. The goddess is pleased, justice is served, and David's death will be avenged. He walks over to the bowl, dips his beak into the mixture, and drinks it all, every last drop. Come, your spirit shall accompany me on my task, that you may witness the justice you have wrought. My neck hair prickles. I'm not sure I want to see this, but I bow my head anyway. Thank you, kind raven. Only a fool would insult the spirits by refusing their gifts. Raven's body sways as he walks to the edge of the altar. Then sleep, and know that what mortals truly crave is not justice. Know it as I do through my eyes. My eyelids droop. I drop to the floor as quick as I can, but for a split second it's like there are two of me. The me lowering myself to the ground, staring up at Raven watching me from the altar, and the other me, standing on the edge of the altar, watching the woman in the black robe's head drop to the floor. And then, I'm whole again. I fluff my feathers. Come, mortal. Raven's voice whispers in my mind. We have much to do. Without my will, my wings spread, but instead of flying for the opening, my head lowers and I dive into a shadow on the floor. Darkness swirls around me, like shadows in the wind. I can't see, but I can feel Raven's wings pull against the shades as if they were my own. There. He flips our tail. Pinpricks of yellow light blink into the stars below, and we spiral down. Moonlight fills the sky above us as a large brick house comes into focus. One I recognize. Deborah's. We're in Salem. Raven's eyes fix on the cars parked in the driveway. Allison's and Kathy's. Ah, uh, book 
club. <laughs> a laugh rumbles in her throat. Your former sister, Allison's daughter, is worried about her meth test. They've gathered to ask Goddess to intervene rather than have her study. We flutter down and land on the living room windowsill. Inside, Allison, Kathy, and Deborah sit around a table holding Deborah's grimoire, hands locked together, eyes closed, heads back, staring up at the ceiling, their mouths moving in unison. Raven shakes our head. Fools, the goddess's favors come at a cost. Blood for a bauble, a soul for a kindness, and justice. Always mortals receive justice. He presses our beak through the glass as if it were the surface of a pond and caws. The needles from the potion I mixed, along with the maggots and rabbit teeth, float from our beak in a stream, real but not. See-through, like smoke. They float across the room, divide into three puffs above their heads, and drop into their upturned mouths. I watch, waiting for them to react, but nothing happens. Do not expect vengeance yet. Raven pulls our beak free of the glass. I assure you they will die, choking on their own lungs. But it is the goddess's wish that they know pain first. He turns and we leap into the night sky. Salem stretches out beneath us. Streetlights pass in blur. The scent of ocean fills our senses and then it all crawls to a stop. Mmm, a party. Raven grumbles as we take perch on a high branch overlooking another house, one I don't recognize. Music thunders from the open doors and deep resonating thuds. It seems your coven's children are all here together. Friends, even. He casually lifts a wing to straighten a feather, but his eyes are fixed on the crowd of teenagers dancing on the patio. These children have not wronged you. Lowering our wing, he shakes our head. Why do you desire justice? Do you not know what men are? He clacks our beak, spreads our wings wide and caws. Desire mercy, not justice, mortal. The matchstick I use to light the candle flies from our mouth toward the house like a missile. The match hits the side of the house. For a moment, time stands still. The dancers stop, hands frozen in the air, the thud of the music stretches out in a long, deep drone, and then everything slams back into motion. Flames explode from the windows and doorways. Bodies tumble through the air and vanish into the night. The roar of the explosion shakes the tree. Boards and fiberglass insulation rain down all around us, but not a single feather ripples on our chest. It is done, mistress. Raven sighs in my mind. Justice is served and the cycle continues. Our wings sag. Do you not understand? Vengeance requires more vengeance, always. The scale tips with weight of your guilt, and so justice must be paid. But I don't understand. Mortals are ever fools. Raven croaks. Come, bear witness, and know what you have done. Turning our back on the fire, Raven jumps into the sky. We land back on Deb's windowsill, and Raven pushes our head through the glass. Slow down. I can't understand you. Deb rounds the side of the couch where Allison and Kathy sit, watching her pace, eyes wide. Wh what? Deb rakes her hair back over the top of her head and moves the phone to her other ear. What do you mean the house exploded? Allison coughs into her hand. Everyone but you? Deb glances at the other two witches watching her, but she can't meet their gaze. Did you call 911? Allison coughs harder. Her face twists into a pained-looking scowl. Kathy's gaze locks on Allison's fist as she takes it from her mouth. Deborah! She whimpers, her voice climbing three octaves in a single word, but even from here, I can see the blood on her hand. Deb spins on her heel, and her eyes drop to Allison's fist. By the goddess. The phone slips to her chin. Jake. She gasps, her eyes scanning the room. Are you wearing that charm I gave you? Her eyes close. Good. Don't take it off, sweetie. Do you hear me? 
Don't you ever take it off. Deborah coughs, winces, and her chin trembles. I love you. Raven pulls our head back through the window, taps on the glass, and Deb wheels around, her gaze locking on us instantly. Justice served, justice required. Steaming the glass with our breath, Raven smears my name into the fog with his beak. The trap is laid, the cycle continues. Perhaps Jake will show you mercy, but do not trust to hope. We turn from the window and spread our wings, but before we leap into the sky, Raven pauses to shake his head. Oh, what fools you mortals be. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. 